Thank you so much for joining us for this 2024 edition of the Joachim Dunge Lectures in International Justice. My name is Emilia Dunge, and I'm the chair of the Association in Memory of Joachim Dunge, who was my brother. He was also an alumnus of the School of Business, Economics, and Law here at Gothenburg University. So what brings us here today? Iwakim was only 33 years old when he was killed while working as a human rights officer in Afghanistan on 1st of April, 2011. It's truly a bizarre thing to outgrow an older sibling, but as I keep aging past him, it continues to baffle me how much he achieved. Other than Gothenburg University, he was also an alumnus of New York University. He worked at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, the Special Court for Sierra Leone, the Temporary International Presence in Hebron, and finally the UN Assistant Mission in Afghanistan. And yet, there should have been so much more. Joachim's friends, colleagues, and family established this association in his memory to continue his work when he could not, through fostering knowledge sharing and an informed debate centered on issues of justice in general and international law in particular. Since 2012, when we started these annual lectures, we've talked about polarization, combating terrorism through international law, weapons of mass destruction, sexual violence and conflict, just to name a few. Uh, you'll soon meet uh, Sari Kovo, who is an associate professor at the School of Business, Economics and Law at Gothenburg University. And she's also a co-organizer of these lectures. So recently, Sari and I wrote a book, uh, we wrote a chapter in, a, in an anthology reflecting on these lectures um, the anthology celebrates the centennial of Gothenburg University's School of Business, Economics, and Law. Uh, our chapter, this reflection, also genuinely became a journey in, in thankfulness to all the speakers who have come here over the years to share their knowledge with, uh, with you and with us, as well as those who make it possible for these speakers to do so. So on that note, before we get going for this year's uh, lecture, I, I want to... Um, uh, I want to introduce... Uh, I want to say a, a heartfelt thanks to Sari. Uh, our communication genius, Marie Örninge, our tech wizard, Christian Ragnarsson, our professor, Joachim Oman, the seminar advisory committee, and the association board. And thank you. There are 264 of you here. I'm so grateful that you could all join us. So some of you are students of international law. Some of you are practitioners and experts in your fields. And some of you are, like me, just engaged folks with an interest in the topic, You're looking to learn more. It is uh, genuinely such a pleasure and an honor to be here with you. Let's move into the 2024 lectures. This year, we're looking at private contractors in war, context, regulations, and policy. Um, a few housekeeping rules before we get started. We are presenting this in webinar mode, as you can see, so we can't see you, but we hope you can see us. You won't be able to use your mics or your cameras, but please do post your questions in the chat and we'll collect them as we go and then post them along the way. We'll do a short break around 10.20. We're also recording this and we hope to put it online in about a week or so. So I mentioned some of Joachim's work postings, but he also published articles in academic journals on a range of topics like crimes against humanity, the right to humanitarian assistance during internal armed conflicts, as well as command responsibility. And command responsibility is one of several conundrums that, uh, that touch on uh, the issues related to private military and security companies or PMSCs. And understanding their relation to the idea of the state is another, as is finding mechanisms for accountability. Our speakers today are going to talk us through these issues and, and more, and they're going to help us understand uh, PMSCs, their role, their governance, and, and available regulations. So joining us are Dr. Joanna de Deus Pereira. Uh, Joanna is a senior research fellow at RUSI Europe. RUSI is the Royal United Services uh, Institute. Uh, she specializes in counterterrorism and, and preventing and uh, encountering violent extremism. She holds a PhD from the Department of War Studies at King's College London and a postdoctorate in migration management and border security, where she focuses on the role of private security providers in the um, management of these areas. We are also thrilled to have Wendy McClinchy, who is the director of the United Nations Program at the Center for Civilians in Conflict, CIVIC. Wendy has served in, in senior policy advisory roles at UN headquarters, as well as several UN offices. She holds a master's degree in international management, organizations, and governance from the London School of Economics, and a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Policy, Institutions, and Behavior uh, from Rutgers University. We also have Dr. Sorcha McLeod, 
who is an associate professor at the Center for Private Governance, CEPRI, um, in the Faculty of Law, University of Copenhagen. Sorka holds a PhD from the University of Glasgow and an LLM in International Natural Resources Law and uh, LLB in Scots Law from the University of Dundee. She is an expert in international human rights law with a particular focus on mercenaries and private military and security companies. Thank you all for being here. Um, we're, we're so excited to, to learn together. Let me now hand over to Professor Joachim Olman. Joachim, please go ahead. Thank you, Emilia. Um, as mentioned, my name is Joachim Oman. I am Professor of Public International Law here in the Department of Law in the School of Business, Economics and Law at the University of Gothenburg. This seminar, as you know, is arranged in cooperation between the department and the association in memory of Joachim Dungel. So I would like to start by uh, welcoming you all to, on behalf of the department and the school, and express my sincere gratitude to the association and its chairperson, Emilia Dungel. This seminar series has been successful cooperation between the department and the association for many years now, and we look forward to many more seminars in the future. I would also like to express my gratitude to Associate Professor Sari Kovo from our department, who has worked together with the association to develop the very interesting and highly relevant theme of this year's seminar. As a representative of the department and the school, I'm of course also very happy to see the list of prominent speakers, which uh, who uh, Emilia has introduced right before me. You are all most welcome and I look forward to listening to your presentations. As always, we have had key administrative support from the faculty and the department in the arrangement of the seminar, and I would therefore also like to thank Maria Örninge and Christian Ragnarsson for that. Uh, this seminar is not only open to the public, it is also a part of the basic course in international law in the law program here in Gothenburg, and I am the director of the course. This means that in addition to the large audience of teachers and researchers, and the external audience from Sweden and abroad. We also have an audience of more than 200 students in the sixth semester of the law program. The theme of the seminar is of course of high relevance for what we teach in international law in the course. How do private contractors in war fit into the international law logic where the main actors are states and international organizations? To what extent do such actors act on behalf of states and to what extent can uh, states be held responsibilities for the acts of private contractors. How are international humanitarian law and international human rights law applied to private contractors? These and many other questions are raised by the theme of this year's Joachim Dungel seminar, during which we will also get to know more about the contexts in specific conflicts in different parts of the world where private contractors are active. So this seminar is a very valuable part of our education and I appreciate the possibility to give this type of seminar open both to the public and to the students. With these words, I would like to hand over to Sari Kovo, who will be the moderator of the first session in the seminar. Thank you. Good morning for me as well. So my name is Sari Kowa and I'm an associate professor here at the law school. And uh, I've had the pleasure to organizing these seminars for quite a few years now together with uh, Emilia and obviously colleagues at the law school. And uh, I should say that I'm particularly happy to moderate this first session in this year's seminar because it's uh, the subject of uh, private military companies in conflict situations. It's, it's a subject that's been with me for quite a few years now. And actually, uh, already back in, I was working, working in Afghanistan just after, the, just after the sort of start of the US war on terror. And obviously this was a time when we saw a huge influx of first uh, uh, US uh, private military security companies into the conflict situation in Afghanistan, but later also over the years, uh, development of 
different both uh, uh, Afghan and foreign security companies that were part of this, uh, well, the conflict situation in Afghanistan. And what was, as an international lawyer and a person sort of concerned for how to solve conflict situations, observing this development was very interesting and also quite concerning because over the years it became also quite clear how the difficulties that the then Afghan government had with tackling the situation because of course there was a constant need of uh, well more actors providing security in Afghanistan. But at the same time, because of the multitude of security actors and also the violations committed by some of these actors, the security was actually not becoming better. Security was particularly not becoming better for people in local communities, something that did affect uh, the well the ability of the afghan government to govern so but this was 15 years ago and i'm very interested now to hear from our two panelists first joanna about what's the trends since then how has this story evolved since the well the early 2000s and later we'll talk turn to sarha to hear about regulation and international law. Please, Joanna, your, the floor is yours for 15 to 20 minutes. Hello, uh, good morning uh, to you all. Uh, first of all, thank you so, so much for, for, for this invitation. It has been uh, an immense pleasure um, considering uh, in particular uh, the, the, the background and, and the objective uh, in memory of, of Joaquin Dungal uh, and the story behind it. Um, and I, I would like to 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 start. Uh, I have some powerpoints, uh, of course, uh, but I would like I would like to to start uh, by saying uh, that uh, mercenaries and and this in the market and the market for security is not a new thing. Um, and this may sound as a cliche right now, but uh, mercenarism um, is pro probably the, the second oldest profession in the world. And and uh, as many authors have said. Um, surely as old uh, as as war uh, itself, um, and uh, it's curious that over the last ten years it has gained uh, such a prominence. I remember when I did my PhD, it was considered a niche, <laughs> a niche uh, um, um, area of study. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, it's very important, and it is ex extremely, and in particular, relevant uh, for us to understand how, for example, policy agendas have been shaped uh, according um, to the presence uh, of, of these actors that have been around for thousands of years, uh, but also how, for example, the um, the type of services uh, they provide uh, has been uh, evolving. Uh, so let me uh, share uh, my screen. Joanna, I think you muted yourself while sharing the screen. Myself. Um, so um, this has been this has been uh, quite uh, a long, a long uh, journey um, since, um, as I said, uh, um, the privatization of war started. We had privatization of war in medieval years in Uruk Egyptians uh, until pretty much uh, the new order of Westphalia and how the states reconfigured the use of force and how this has become um, uh, 
uh, a business itself. So this private security uh, boom uh, ended uh, pretty much uh, with the Cold War, and it ended by opening a security a security vacuum uh, around the world, especially in in colonial uh, regions where the need to continue to influence. Um, uh, either by the United States or Russia um, uh, needed much to 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 continue this control from a proxy uh, manner, and many countries, in fact, downsized their military forces to 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 try to reduce the financial burden uh, during this period, and. Some some of the, the the key scenarios were in Angola, Rwanda, Somalia, uh, Sierra Leone, uh, the pretty much known South Africa, and the executive outcomes um, um, creation. Uh, also, um, the the use of force in Mozambique. We have two different phases in Mozambique post um, post civilian war, and one more much 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 more recently with the Wagner Group. One case that we will talk about probably uh, on the next on on my next um, on my next uh, uh, period on the on the second phase of this uh, of this lecture. Uh, but as you can see there, uh, the numbers of civilian contracted to support uh, military operations in war and conflict has been varying uh, according um, according to the different conflicts they were. Um, involved uh but for example you can see there that for example in the balkans and this is a rough number um the contracted number of personnel reached almost 20000 we know that this number and that number there for afghanistan is pretty much um a, a low estimate of what was really used um but now it's in truth uh, with the Wagner Group in the media, and also with this globalization of information, uh, what we know about private security is much more um, immediate and also uh, much more uh, diffuse in a certain sense. We know more, but at the same time, we know um, um, pretty much uh, less in terms of their operations and in terms of, of their um, uh, covered, for example, uh, uh, operations in certain areas, even in uh, contracted by some governments. So we could roughly say, and this is the, the typology that Peter Singer um, did in 2003, today this is pretty much outdated, but basically he separated uh, private military companies from private security companies, being private military companies, the ones that are military providers, uh, also military consulting companies and military support uh, companies. These uh, nowadays, um, they provide um, different uh, type of, of services. Um, for example, they obviously, they all always pro uh, provided training, but you have now, for example, tech service and cyber, um, what we, watch today pretty much between um, what is happening uh, between uh, Ukraine and Russia, um, for example, in the use of drones. Also, what uh, we also observe uh, in the Middle East with the use of drones, it's usually made by a very, very highly trained um, um, highly trained uh, um, civilians with military capacity and also with technology capacity that are operating uh, this type of, of systems, but also strategic reconnaissance, um, uh, corporate espionage. Um, so it's not always about the war uh, and, and the field, uh, but also political risk analysis and also asset trace uh, and uh, recovery. Um, this scheme that you see now, um, it is one that was uh, provided um, by the, uh, the 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 Council of Europe very recently on a, on a research reef. Um, and I cut the image on purpose because the left part of the image talked about uh, models and typology uh, of uh, private uh, military and security companies and put inside the same bag, for example, companies like Wagner, that as far as I'm concerned, as far as my research has allowed to, uh, 
to understand, it is a paramilitary organization. And this is very important to understand why, because most of these companies uh, are legitimate companies and they are uh, some of them in, in the stock market, uh, some of them uh, operate in several countries, some of them have um, several um, contracts with uh, major NGOs, major international organizations, and some of them support, for example, um, uh, humanitarian organizations from the United Nations in several in several countries. Um, this this change uh, in filling the security gap from after um, after the Cold War and um, uh, and then another period after 9/11 um, has been uh, quite um, I would say dynamic uh, for these companies. In, in in a sense that the, the, the they have been profiting a lot of a legal vacuum and and they have been mm, actual the providers uh, and the most uh, efficient and and discreet um service um service implementers uh, offering a uh, plausible uh, deniability um, and in a certain way political pragmatism towards no government wants to have a high number of deaths um in their in their toll in their official toll uh and for example uh we know um, from the information um, after all these years of the first stage of the Afghan, uh, Afghan war and also in the first stage of the uh, um, Iraq uh, uh, war that the number of death um, of, um, of uh, corporate warriors um, in the conflict was extremely uh, high. Um, and after after this boom, this transnationalization of terror, and especially in in regions where um, there was a, a fragility of power, um, these companies started not only to uh, reinvent themselves, but also to um, to mushroom in 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 a sense that they they had the capacity not only to adapt to local and and regional uh, specificities, uh, but um, at the same time they produced and created their own uh, model of commercial activity. For that reason, you now have companies like these, for example, managing migration flows, also. For example, uh, running detention centers for migrants uh, and refugees, either at the source um, where the migrants depart and also uh, at the uh, destination uh, country. And their tasks, for example, involve um, neutralization of activists, for example, for, for big multinationals. It's important to understand that we are not only talking about the war business. So the, the environment, the, the whole um, ecosystem of, of, of the, the market for security is absolutely immense. And we should not stick only um, to these immediate images that uh, get to us uh, over Twitter or over media uh, every single day. And, and lastly, um, the, the idea of avoiding the body, uh, the body back syndrome that I was mentioning, that is to reduce the official numbers of deaths uh, on official military, um, uh, military groups, um, amongst uh, different uh, countries. You can see there several companies um, that are in the market that are registered. Most of them are legitimate uh, businesses. Um, as companies, they are um, obviously uh, profit uh, oriented. Um, they follow also um, corporate standards, uh, principles, uh, and also uh, values. Um, and this has been a way that has been uh, traced by the companies themselves because they they want to seek legitimacy also to uh, have more shares in the market. And, uh, and, and, and Sora will surely talk about this in, in the second phase. So for these companies that you see there, they also seek 
um, to be recognized as companies and as services uh, providers. Um, and let's not forget that most of the times, uh, these uh, security uh, companies, some of them have military capacity, um, serve as as liaison uh, between governments and and professional soldiers um, to avoid, um, for example, uh, having contracts between uh, individuals, individuals, uh, individual soldiers, mercenaries, uh, and and uh, governments. Um, there was a very interesting phrase um, some years ago that was said by David Eisenberg um, that PMCs are, are, are uh, United States military is American Express card. And the fact is that from the, 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 the 90s onwards, uh, in every conflict the United States were involved, or almost all conflicts where the United States were involved, um, it was uh, very common to see uh, the use uh, of these companies um, uh, cooperating and coordinating with official uh, military, military forces. Um, for example, um, this is um, more or less uh, Eric Prince Empire. Eric Prince uh, founded Blackwater, one of the most famous uh, private military companies um, in in the in the world. Um, and you see that that, for example, he had several operations not only in USA, but the, probably the most known ones are uh, Iraq uh, and Afghanistan. But also, for example, he has several operations in Somalia, and there you can see anti-piracy force. So uh, let's be honest, uh, this is not only about fighting on the ground, it's also, for example, fighting mar maritime piracy. We now we are now assisting to an escalation in the in the Red Sea. Um, probably the, the the response forces that will come after now will be for sure um, contracted from the 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 private uh, the private um, market. Um, but you have now, uh, if you, we had before um, companies uh, dominating uh, this market uh, as Blackwater uh, or, for example, executive outcomes. Um, South Africans were extremely important in the development of this business. I will explain after um, the role of executive outcomes in, in uh, the foundation or the ideal ideological formulation uh, of Wagner. Um, but it's not only about the Americans. You have nowadays um, Russian companies as well. You have Turkish companies and you also have Chinese companies. We will talk in the second phase of this uh, lecture about the differences uh, um, amid them. But the important thing is that you need to know that this is not something that is abnormal. This is something that is actually happening more and more frequently. Um, and uh, it's very, very normal to have these companies interacting sometimes even in the same place. What is curious, for example, just unveiling a little bit is where Russian um, and, and Chinese companies are operating in the same on, on, on the same country. They tend not to um, um, to conflict in the in their share of the market, but they tend, for example, to provide different types of market. Um, Chinese mercenaries, for example, they rarely use uh, weapons. For example, they are much more on the surveillance, uh, on the provision of information, and they are always, for example, connected to the government. And and I will explain later that in the specific case of the Wagner Group, this was not. Um, this was not precisely um, the what was happening. And just to um, to conclude, there are several problems arising from the the privatization of warfare and the use of force, and many many questions. And you ask me, these questions were always there. Perhaps some of the questions were there, but has um, 
uh, we um, advance to uh, a transnationalization uh, of threats and also uh, to a very, very shape shifting uh, threat scenario. Um, this distorting effects of the privatization of warfare have been exacerbated over the last years. And I would say that uh, probably over the last five years, even with more uh, intensity for several reasons, um, because they uh, are under a marketplace uh, logic. If you commodify a war that is and should and uh, be traditional under the, the sphere of state, especially after the norms introduced by the Treaty of Westphalia, and you adapt um, and you and and you start to look at war uh, um, not as something that is fully and only controlled by states, but uh, abiding um, by the strategies of open open uh, open market. You are also opening um, the doors to other uh, to other uh, problems and challenges, uh, such as an escalation of conflict or a multiplication of conflict, and also. Uh, um, creating uh, not only moral hazards, but I think uh, for great importance for this lecture and, and you, I believe the most of you are law students, um, the dimension of the human rights violation uh, and, and how the clients themselves um, basically wash their hands uh, regarding um, how, how they put citizens uh, at risk or not, if they are violating the, the laws of war or not, because they will be worried only about the violation uh, of a contract. They can also um, uh, breed more wars. And, and, and as this supply and demand dynamics uh, intensify, uh, these can lead regions and conflicts um, to be swamped uh, in, in, in warfare, for example. Uh, and uh, side by side to this, you also have um, probably an economic escalation and a dispute in the market um, due to the profit uh, motive, um, because uh, mercenaries, um, uh, mercenaries and some of these companies um, are sometimes incentivized to, to, to prolong conflicts. This was, for example, the case of some of, 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 of um, of the commentaries made by Eric Prince um, during the Afghan war when he had this crazy idea, for example, of trying to replace all the official militaries by private military contractors, for example. Um, and this supply <laughs> demand dynamics as well um, may start to, to, to generate artificial uh, demands uh, for, for their services. And this can lead as well to, to predatory behaviors from, from, from these companies uh, like uh, racketeering. Um, and finally, uh, there are several other challenges um, that are raised by the use uh, of these companies um, in, in warfare scenarios. The first one, um, the ones of legitimacy and accountability, um, the question of regulation, the question of impunity regarding human rights that Sarkha uh, and Wendy will talk about is probably the most important and relevant one that still needs to be debated and still needs to be regulated. Then obviously the, the weakening of, of, of state uh, sovereignty, um, it, there is a, a tendency uh, to create in a certain way extend dependency to compete with national uh, forces. Um, in terms of performance, uh, the fact um, that they are transnational, tr transactional uh, by nature, that they are in the market, they um, put these uh, companies in, in, in a special place to overlook political uh, and, and economic conflict routes as well. So they do not really care about where the conflict comes from, but they just want to, to, to profit uh, with the conflict. And here, obviously, I'm not talking about the whole other panoply of services that these companies offer but focusing on those that operate uh, on, on war and conflict scenarios. 
then they are also a threat to peace um, and, 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 and stability. These companies, they, 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 they are um, breathing very uh, um, healthily in 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 fragile um in fragile um conflict in fragile scenarios in fragile countries and they usually undermine peace efforts let's look at what is happening in central african republic and for example former uh, french um uh, colonies um, where, uh, for example, these Russian companies uh, have operated and what this has done, not only in terms of violation of human rights, but also how they have contributed to the degradation of the of the already fragile situation um, these countries were before they, they entered. And then in terms of, for example, operations that involve intelligence, and sharing of information, we have a huge gap in terms of um, oversight and, and ethical concerns um, on how and on how the information is gathered, but also how the information uh, is shared for the profit of war. Um, and, and most of the times against, uh, for examples, uh, against the, the, the stability of the country and against the civilians themselves. And, and finally, the economic and security dilemmas. We are talking about market, we are talking about a business, but we are also talking about countries. We are also talking about human rights. We are also talking about the health and, and the vertical um, structure uh, of what uh, binds a country together and what it means to be a, a non-fragile country, for example. This creates not only a uh, political economy challenges, but also warfare challenges um, that uh, lead to several other challenges. We are faced with a vicious cycle um, where these companies are operating that are usually intrinsically connected to the fragility um, of the scenarios uh, where they breed. And I think I will uh, stop here and um, I will uh, now give the word to, to Sari to, to proceed um, with my colleagues. I think I was on time. You were perfectly on time, Joanna. <laughs> and thank you very much for a fascinating overview. And uh, listening to you, I sort of, it's very clear that this is, listening both to the overview that you provide of uh, the mushrooming of private military and security companies for very different uh, different purposes, but also to the analysis, sort of clearly showing that with this dynamic of private military and security companies in the in a way uh, in an increasingly conflict prone world, well. This can, the fact that we have access to private military security can actually lower the bar for conflict and push more conflict. And that's obviously an important issue for the international community and the community of nations. And it is also something that does need to be uh, regulated at the international level. But I as an international lawyer, I recognize that this is far from an evident thing to do. So very keen now to hear from Sorha about what's been done and what can be done, what can be done. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sari, and uh, thank you, Emilia, for the, the, the introduction and the the warm welcome. I'm I'm very happy and, and honoured um, to be here today. I think this is a a wonderful uh, legacy for for Joachim. Um, I work in my UN capacity as a member of the UN Working Group on the Use of Mercenaries. Um, I work closely with uh, legal advisors and human rights officers, and uh, I know how hard they work, and I know uh, how important their their work is 
in helping to ensure that human rights are um, uh, protected and respected uh, uh, around the world. And um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm particularly um, touched to be in, invited to, to contribute to the, the lectures this, this year. Um, uh, I should say that I'm I'm speaking today in my academic uh, capacity, um, but as I mentioned, I'm also a member of the UN Working Group on the Use of Mercenaries. I've been asked to, to talk a bit about uh, the work of the the UN Working Group, um, so I will I will do that towards the end of my my uh, my uh, remarks. So I have some slides. Um, let me just get them on the screen. All right. So, um, as I, as I said, I've been asked to to and, and as uh, Joanna has has said, I've been asked to speak about the the regulation of uh, uh, the types of actors uh, that she's highlighted in in her in her uh, her first uh, part of the session, and I think what we I think what Joanna's presentation highlights is that we are dealing with multiple different types of actors. And there is disagreement about the terminology that gets used to describe these actors. There's disagreement about what it is that they uh, should in fact uh, be doing. And I think it's important to recognize that not all states agree on the use of private actors in uh, in situations of armed conflict and in, and in, in situations of the provision of, of security. And what do I mean by that? Well, if we look at the different types of security provision that these kinds of actors are involved in, in offering, we can say that they exist um, on, a, on a spectrum. And the reality is, is that they uh, operate in both peacetime situations um, all the way through to situations of armed conflict. And uh, again, Joanna mentioned some of the, the, the different types of um, uh, provisions uh, or, or services that these actors offer. So if we start at the in peacetime situations, we see um, unarmed security guards operating in a variety of different circumstances and we probably encounter them um, our, ourselves on a on a daily on a daily basis whether that be in public transport or we're uh, going to to a sporting event or or a concert we we might encounter um security uh, security guards they tend to be unarmed they're operating in a peacetime situation then we can have um, armed security guards um who may be carrying um, um, weapons, um, they may be carrying firearms, um, and they tend to be used in situations around uh, money transfers um, and offering security for, for gated, gated communities in some contexts, some countries. Then we move into situations of armed conflict, and this is where it gets even more um, complicated because we can have um, armed security guards who are guarding people and assets, so guarding embassies, consulates, perhaps even providing security for NGOs and humanitarian actors uh, who are providing um, perhaps food or medical supplies in a situation um, of, armed, uh, of armed conflict. And, uh, but they are, these are, they are not, um, uh, actively um, engaging in the armed conflict. They are not fighting in the armed conflict, but they are providing security services within a situation of armed conflict. And then we, we move, as we move towards the right hand side of the, the spectrum, we can see that in conflict affected areas, these actors are providing a whole variety of, of, of different, uh, different services. Um, but there is only one type of um, actor that is actually legally defined, and that is a mercenary. And a mercenary has a very, very specific legal, uh, legal meaning, and this is where they are actively participating in the hostilities uh, in, this, in the situation of an armed conflict, so they are engaged in, uh, in the, the fighting. 
what is common between all of uh, these, these different actors is that they are all capable of uh, being involved in, in human rights violations. And of course, that's um, uh, of particular concern, even in peacetime situations, um, when we're seeing them being used, for example, in the context of uh, migration uh, detention, um, where, where people are in a very vulnerable um, situation. And we saw, and we saw that human rights violations were increasing uh, during um, the COVID nineteen pandemic, where private security firms were being used um, in hospitals, uh, in vaccination um, facilities, in testing facilities, and having access, for example, to people's private uh, medical information, or um, in cases where they were providing security for um, for uh, uh, hotels and other detention uh, facilities where people were were were, were staying um, um, for quarantine purposes we we had we saw that there were um uh, allegations that they were being involved in in sexual harassment and sexual violence for for example um so they are they're in all of these circumstances they're capable of violating human rights in situations of armed conflict, they, it, it's possible that they, they, they may be involved in uh, violations of international humanitarian law. And we've seen in, in, in contexts uh, like uh, 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 Central African Republic, in Mali, in Libya, in, in Syria, in Ukraine, that there have been uh, suggestions that they, they have been involved in violations uh, that would rise to the level of, of war crimes or in some cases crimes against humanity. But from a legal perspective, we need to know who these actors are and we need to know how they're, um, how they're um, defined. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to very quickly give you an overview of um, the, the, the regulation um, that is in place for these actors. And I think what we can say um, in, in general, is that while there is regulation, certainly of, of mercenaries, um, and there is some regulation of private military and security companies, we can say that they are under-regulated. They're under-regulated um, uh, in different for different in different ways. So, for example, if we if we look at um, uh, the the um, the Geneva Convention Additional Protocol One, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. Um, there are you can see that that um, it's really very possible for um, for those for that provision uh, and for that definition to be to be circumvented. If you look at the International Convention on Mercenarism, there are only thirty seven state parties uh, to that to that convention. When it comes to the to to the, the private military and security company side, what we can see is that we have soft law mechanisms. We don't yet have an international uh, internationally binding instrument on private military and security companies. And uh, although the Montreux document does bring together existing legal provisions, and so we've, we we this is this is a this is a major challenge. And I think what we've seen with um, the, the the rise of um, entities like the the Wagner Group um, and uh, the uh, Sadat that uh, that is a, a Turkish uh, company that's involved in the recruitment of 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 mercenaries. Um, that that what we're seeing is that states are using these actors as as proxy actors, and they're circumventing the existing international legal um, legal um, frameworks. So let's look at um, the protocol additional to the Geneva Convention, um, and this is a protocol that is specifically focused on uh, victims and protection of victims in situations of armed armed conflict. And there is a provision in Article 47 of this additional protocol, which defines a mercenary. It's very much focused on status. And it provides very clearly that if you meet the if you meet this definition of mercenary, you are not defined as a combatant under the Geneva Convention, uh, and therefore you do not um, you're not entitled to the protections of prisoner of prisoners of war. The, the definition of mercenary is complex. It is also a cumulative um, definition. 
And it's actually very, very difficult to meet the definition of mercenary under international law, under the Geneva Conventions. So if you, for example, ask me, uh, are there um, mercenaries participating in the armed conflict in Ukraine? I would say to you, the answer is yes and no. And that's because of the, the definition that we, that we have here. So there are six cumulative elements. The first three are inclusive. You have to be specifically recruited to participate in the fighting in an armed conflict. You did in fact participate in the, the hostilities and that you were motivated by private gain and that the private gain that you received was substantially more than uh, other uh, than, than members of the, the regular armed, armed forces. Now, it can be pecuniary um, uh, financial compensation, but it could also be other forms of, uh, of, of compensation. So we've seen uh, recently, for example, that um, people who are being recruited from countries like Syria, so a, war, uh, a, a conflict affected country, are not only being offered money, but they're also being offered um, uh, citizenship um, by, by, by Turkey, for, for example. Um, and so that would fit into, into um, the, the, the compensation definition. But what you can see is these are all very subjective elements. How do you prove what somebody's motivation is for, uh, for, 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 becoming, a, for becoming a mercenary? It's very, very difficult um, to do that. Um, and then the final three um, elements are, uh, are also problematic. So if you're a national of a party to a conflict, then um, you would not be defined um, as, uh, as, a, as a mercenary, which is so if we look at the, the Ukraine situation, if you're a Russian national and you're participating in the conflict in Ukraine, then you would not meet the, the definition of mercenary uh, contained in Article 47. Similarly, if you are um, a member of the armed forces um, of a party to the conflict, similarly, you would not meet the definition of, um, of mercenary. And this is a provision that a lot of states are starting to circumvent. So we see that um, many states around the world, um, in order to participate in armed conflicts, are recruiting from other countries, very often conflict-affected countries or countries that have are in a, a situation post-conflict, um, but they have people who have military experience, who have fighting experience. So that's why we see people being recruited from Syria, for example. Um, but they are then being integrated into the, uh, the armed forces of a particular country and then deployed into, into the armed conflict. And then the final, uh, final element is if you've been sent on official duty, um, then uh, you uh, do not meet the definition. Now, th this provision was put in place um, to protect uh, peacekeepers, for example. Um, so peacekeepers, UN peacekeepers who've been, for example, who've been sent to, to conflicts would not be defined as mercenaries because they've been sent on, on official, official duty. But again, this is a this is a, a provision that we can see is being circumvented by uh, by states um, in in using proxy actors. So Russia using Wagner, for example, when um, and this is where uh, the the working group on the use of mercenaries we we sent what are called communications or allegation letters to Russia uh, in relation to Wagner and um, alleged human rights violations in both. Um, uh, Lib in, sorry, in Libya, in Central African Republic, in, in Mali. And Russia's response uh, to us has always been um, that, uh, uh, that they uh, sent uh, instructors or trainers on official business to those countries on the basis of bilateral agreements with the governments of those of those countries, the important thing, the other important thing to understand about the, about Article Forty Seven, if I just uh, go back for uh, for a second, is it doesn't it doesn't prohibit mercenarism. It doesn't create a criminal offence, and that is the, in in direct contrast to the African Convention, um, which you can see. 
in Article 1 has a very similar, almost identical um, definition of mercenary to the Geneva Convention. They were drafted very much um, at, the same, at the same time uh, back in the 1970s. But you can see that Article 1, Paragraph 2 does in fact create a crime of mercenarism and it can be uh, uh, the crime of mercenarism may be committed by individuals by groups by associations by representatives of a state or the state itself with the aim of opposing by armed violence a process of self-determination stability or the territorial integrity of another another state and it criminalizes the organization the financing the use the equipment the training of um uh, of mercenaries um as well as the, the the recruitment but again the african convention is only um uh, supported um by about half um of the members of the african of the african uh, african union so um like the um the un convention which i which i mentioned only has 37 state parties states are not really stepping up here um and uh, committing to the international uh, legal uh, legal frameworks. And why is that? Well, it's quite simply because in, in some circumstances, they want to be able to use um, uh, mercenaries and mercenary type uh, type actors, either to shore up their um, their armed forces, to retain power, to be able to um, uh, uh, to stay in power, um, or more recently, we've seen them um, being used to to uh, to combat um, uh, violent extremism and as a counterterrorism um, measure. The, the UN Convention or the International Convention um, has both similarities and differences from the Geneva Convention and the African Convention. So the definition is, is slightly different. Um, it only has five elements. There is no requirement to prove that the individual direct, did in fact directly participate in hostilities, but it does uh, create um, um, an offence. Um, and states that are parties to the convention are expected to implement at the, the national level uh, provisions which will uh, which will criminalize the recruitment, the, the use, the training and the financing of uh, of mercenaries. Now, it's also important to understand that even though there are only 37 state parties to the convention, some states that are not parties to the to to this convention or the African Convention do have uh, national provisions in place. So, for example, if you look at Switzerland, Switzerland, um, which has a long history of 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 mercenarism, um, the, the the Swiss Swiss mercenaries were uh, uh, the the Reichslaufer were were one of the the kind of uh, key early examples of of mercenaries. Um, but today, Switzerland has an absolute prohibition on Swiss nationals fighting for any other uh, for any other country or entity other than other than Switzerland. Um, there is a provision within the Swiss Military Code of Criminal Justice which has that absolute absolute uh, uh, criminal pro prohibition. So um, it's not all it's not all doom and gloom but the reality is um that there is um there is not a, a consistent and coherent consensus at the international level about the use of these uh, these types of actors and i think we can also see this very clearly when it comes to uh private military and, uh, and security sector um what we see here is that there is a real polarization um, of um, of states. So historically, um, and some of you may be familiar with the work of, of Max Weber, Max Weber um, has, uh, you know, is, is, is well known for having written that um, the monopoly on the use of force remains with the state. And historically, that has always, that has been, that has been the, the case. It was states uh, Joanna mentioned the, the, the piece of Westphalia. Um, af after states were created, it was states that uh, retained the, the, the right to use force, uh, whether that be to defend uh, borders 
or to uh, re uh, retain control and maintain uh, security in, uh, within, within borders. But what we've seen happening is that increasingly states have been outsourcing the use of force to non-state actors, to, to, to private actors. And um, they, they have done so across the spectrum that I, I showed in, in the, the, first, the first slide. But what has not happened is um, it, it, the, the, the legal environment, the regulatory environment has not kept up um, with this increasing outsourcing of security to the to the private sector. Um, and so we saw, you know, in the late 1990s in, in the, 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 um, the, the Balkans conflict, and then in the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, we saw the, the, the use of uh, PMSCs in those, in those conflicts. And they were involved in a, a variety of uh, human rights um, uh, violations, um, and they were not regulated. And indeed, in Iraq, uh, the United States uh, government um, put in place a specific provision that um, uh, absolved uh, or protected them from any kind of, 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 of prosecution. And of course, that's what we saw with the, with the, the operatives uh, of the, the Blackwater uh, company who were involved in uh, the Nisar Square massacre in, in, in Baghdad, where, um, uh, uh, where, where uh, civilians were killed and, and many more injured. And the Iraqi government wanted to prosecute them and wasn't wasn't uh, permitted wasn't permitted to. Now, ultimately, they were prosecuted in the United States until uh, former President Trump um, uh, pardoned uh, pardoned them, which really undermines the um, you know international human rights and international humanitarian uh, law, and it's something that the the working group on the use of mercenaries highlighted in a in a public statement. But after after that uh, uh, after that situation, after Iraq, after Afghanistan, the international community realized: well, we do need to have some sort of regulation of these actors. They fall through the gaps. Um, they don't necessarily meet the international legal definition of mercenary. But again, there is polarization. There is disagreement between states. Um, so some states would say that all of these private military and security companies um, uh, should not. Uh, should not uh, exist. That states should not outsource the use of force to the private private sector. Um, so Cuba, for example, would would take that take that position. Other states would say no. As states, they have the sovereign right to uh, to to authorize the use of force by by private uh, by private uh, contractors. Um, but that 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 schism, that polarization between states, has a huge impact on the on the regulatory environment, as we'll see. So after after Blackwater, um, the, the the International Committee of the Red Cross and the the Swiss government um, initiated what became known as the Swiss Initiative, and ultimately became the the Montreux document on the pertinent international legal obligations and good practices for states related to operations of private military and security companies during armed conflict. It doesn't create any, this instrument does not create any new uh, provisions. It, it, it brings together existing international uh, legal uh, provisions, and it talks about the obligations of the sending state, of the territorial state, um, and of the, 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 host, the host state. Um, uh, and it's very much designed to ensure that uh, that different countries put in place provisions at the the national level um, to regulate these kinds of uh, these kinds of actors to make sure that they are. If you're going to outsource to the private sector, that you do so in a way that is in accordance with international human rights law, with international humanitarian law. Um, with law, uh, with the laws on the on the use of force, um, for for example, and it also encourages um, states to ensure that uh, these kinds of actors are properly vetted, that there's proper training in place, um, and that they are um, that they are that they are well well governed. Um, 
Um, so we have the Montreux document. We also have the Montreux document forum, um, which has, um, I think, 57 member states now. Um, so only about a quarter of, 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 of UN member states belong to the to the Montreux uh, document forum. But there is quite a broad, broad membership. Um, and um, there are also some international organizations um, that are involved. So, for example, um, the, the, the EU. So it's a forum which um, is trying to develop um, good practices and, and support states in developing the regulatory environment for these kinds of actors. We also have the International Code of Conduct for Private Security Providers um, that followed on from the, the Montreux document. The Montreux document was not focused on companies themselves. The Code of Conduct is. It's a multi-stakeholder organization. The code was amended in 2021. It has, um, so while the Montreux document um, applies to uh, situations of armed conflict, the code of conduct applies to what it uh, defines as complex environments, which would include armed conflict, but also um, uh, post-conflict situations and situations where the rule of law has been uh, limited by environmental disaster, humanitarian um, disaster. Um, it's a relatively limited document when it comes to human rights. It mentions about half a dozen uh, human rights provisions. It talks about how um, companies that are uh, certified to the code um, are uh, have to make sure that they're not in violation of the right to life, the right, uh, the, the the prohibition on torture, and then um, there are some human rights provisions on detention, on discrimination, sexual and gender based violence, child labour, and human human trafficking. The 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 code um, uh, and the International Code of Conduct Association. Um, so the code's been around since 2010, and um, the International Code of Conduct Association has been has been around for a decade as well. Um, uh, and there are more and more companies that are joining the 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 code and joining the the Code of Conduct Association, but. Um, it's, it's still very problematic. There are issues around whether certification is a suitable way for determining human rights um, compliance. I'm, I'm seeing Sari there. I'm guessing that uh, I'm, I'm going to wrap up in the next two minutes, Sari, if you'll, if you'll allow me. Um, it was a rather it was ambitious to try and talk about all of these uh, all of these things here. There is an open ended intergovernmental working group on private military and security companies within the UN system. It's been around uh, for 14 years or versions of it have been around for 14 years where there have been attempts to try to develop an instrument um, to govern uh, PMSCs. Um, you can see that there, there were there were several meetings uh, starting in 2010. There's a new version of the open-ended intergovernmental working group. Um, I, I call it um, Schrodinger's um, working group or Schrodinger's instrument because we're in the process of developing an instrument that um, nobody can agree on what its status will be. So we have an instrument that is being drafted both as a treaty and also as a soft law instrument, because again, states cannot agree whether there should be an internationally binding instrument or whether, whether a soft law instrument is enough. And we've got polarization between, uh, between states. So you have the United States, for example, on one hand that says, we, we don't need an international instrument. We have the Montreux document, we have the International Code of Conduct, um, um, and other states, particularly from the, the Global South, so South Africa, for example, says we absolutely have to have a binding instrument because that's the only way we can protect, um, we can protect victims. From the, the working group um, on, on Mercenary's um, perspective, it's really important, and from my perspective as an academic, it's really important that that is resolved. It's really important that we de decide whether this instrument applies outside of armed conflicts to all those other situations, so migration management, for example, that these actors are, are operating in. It's really important that um, human rights provisions are properly um, included and that there are strong accountability mechanisms in, included um, with remedies for, for victims, because at the moment, 
if you if you look at the you know the Wagner Group for example, only one person the, the Wagner Group has been operating for uh, for 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 about a decade now, um, and only one individual from the Wagner Group has has been prosecuted. Um, and that wasn't even for, for human rights violations, it was simply for mercerism, and that was in Kyrgyzstan. And so we have a huge gap when it comes to um, accountability. Um, I was going to talk about the, work, the UN Working Group on the Use of Mercenaries, but I will save that for the, the second uh, part of the, of, the, um, of the discussions today. Thank you, and apologies for, for going overboard. Thank you very much. I think that both Joanna and Solha could have their cameras on now for the question and, questions and answers. Uh, and uh, we've had a fascinating few presentations, really giving an excellent overview of both the practice and some of the efforts to regulate private, private military and security companies. We are also getting a host of questions in the chat. So I should also then stress that some of the questions we might not have time for now, but we'll then take them in the next session. And there was also a question about PowerPoints. So I'll say that already, not to forget it, as the whole seminar will be is recorded and will be online on our website in a, in a week or so, you will then also obviously have access to the PowerPoints. Questions. We have a number of questions for both Joanna, for Joanna specifically, and then for Solha. I'll start with uh, Joanna. And uh, one of the questions that is coming in is because you, you have ex expertise both on counterterrorism and then on uh, private military security companies. So, how in many current conflict situations with then sitting in situations where they basically private military military security companies are fighting illegal armed non-state non-state armed groups how does this look in practice uh with actually then in situations where there no state present and then two other questions to you as well what are the efforts to actually, or what's the dynamic of including or incorporating some of these private military security companies into a regular armed forces? Does that happen? And then we zoom out to a sort of much higher political level and uh, a question about the links between at the global links, at the global level, links between private military security companies and a sort of the far right. So, big questions for you, Solha, uh, to sort of pull down, uh, to sort of understand the regulation. We have a question about okay. If I'm a villager in, let's say, Mali, and my uh, a family member has been killed and my house has been burnt down and I crave justice and reparations, what do I do? Who do I turn to if the violations have been co committed by a private military security companies? And in that vein, also a question about, okay, uh, you've sort of provided this overview of guidelines and regulation. What are the sort of practical steps to actually make states adhere to these rules, states and other actors? We'll start by those, Joanna and then Sodha, and then we take another round, round of questions as well. Joanna, you are muted. Yeah, I am. I was <laughs> sorry. Uh, the first question uh, on on non-state uh, armed groups. I don't know if I if I full uh, understood it, but your uh, the, the question is about counterterrorism efforts uh, um, and and uh, the use of non-state armed groups. Is that it? Yes. 
uh, okay, you you know, uh, my this this my presentation ended up with a slide that I didn't show <laughs> uh, precisely. Uh, and the question for the students was, do you think there is a space for uh, these companies on counterterrorism uh, efforts? Um, and this has been quite um, a debated and heated question, um, especially uh, because if there was this idea during Afghanistan and Iraqi war of, of this combination of geopolitical efforts and the combination of cost effectiveness, and it was somehow still under control and the violations were not as visible as we see it now because of widespread communication and, and media. Nowadays, it's much more difficult to allegate and advocate for uh, the presence and, and the inclusion of these groups in, um, in, in counter uh, terrorism efforts. However, uh, and especially in in scenarios uh, uh, such as in in Africa, and I'm talking in specifically in in the Sahel and and Central and West Africa, um, this is presently a little bit uh, out uh, uh, of control, and and I will explain this on 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 the second fa phase of my of my lecture. But as as Sarha was explaining, there are huge differences between the services provided by these companies. So we need to understand that we are now discussing them as evils when we have been dealing with them on a daily basis. We go to a bank, we have the security is made by private security. Uh, in our daily life, we are surrounded by private security. And this has, has also normalized this market for security. And this is very important because this is a question of perception. And perception changes with how you contact with the negative and positive impacts of this perception. So this is this is very important in 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 terms of how counterterrorism efforts uh, uh, would be uh, uh, including these groups uh, or not. Presently, as a matter of perception, this would be negatively uh, regarded. We have huge uh, packages of sanctions, for example, regarding the Wagner Group because it was so intensely on the media, but. The others from, for example, the Turkish companies, from even the, the, the South African companies are completely set aside. There are several, several um, human rights violations uh, constantly committed, for example, at refugees and, uh, and hosting centers, and nobody talks about this. So this is a very complex question that has to, to, to do with perception. Secondly, on the efforts to include some PMCs into regular armed force contracts, this would be the subversion <laughs> of the control and, and regular use of force. What happens is whenever it's needed, uh, um, states uh, make these contracts. And again, let's look at the normalization of these services. Um, I will give you a, a very simple example. Logistics, supply, water supply, food supply in war scenarios is protected by these companies. It's only normal that for the oper uh, uh, operability of these um of 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 the of the um, of the tactics on the ground that these companies operate uh, in a contractual relationship with the government. If you, if the question now includes, for example, if these companies, for example, in relation to uh, to Wagner Group, that it's uh, known that they will be included in in regular military forces. If this is the question, I will answer it after because this is. Um, this connects to another dimension. I, I, I'm trying to encapsulate everything that Sorha said uh, because this dimension of what is regulated, non-regulated, and what is legitimate and non-legitimate, it's extremely important also to the perception on how these companies are, are contracted. And it's very important to also to understand that we cannot demonize the services these companies uh, provide because most of 
the states are not in position to offer in full um, the, 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 or at least with the uh, effectiveness and cost effectiveness that they offer, for example, logistic supports in, in war scenarios, for example. Then the links to global um, uh, PMCs and far right. It is widely known, and this became even uh, uh, more evident in the media, that there is a rise on, on, on the training and recruitment um, of far right and specific groups um, that are training and recruiting uh, uh, for PMCs and, and for um some of them uh, paramilitary groups that are based, uh, for example, in, in, in the Western Balkans that have connections uh, uh, with Russia. But this has been um, uh, um, striving in an in a, in a ecosystem that first is very um, shadowy, is very gray. Um, and secondly, uh, in the case of far right, it has become extremely complex because it involves disinformation, massive disinformation. And this is a component that, for example, for Wagner, it's also important. So disinformation, far right and training are very close aligned with this new dimension of PMCs um, and, and, and paramilitary organizations linked uh, to, to the far right. So it's not only about um, the, the dimensions and the services that uh, uh, I, I mentioned and that Sorha reinforced. Uh, we are now presently, and when looking at far right in particular, to the disinformation realm that is causing massive impact in the, the triggering of new threats and even the triggering of violent actions that um, pass from, for example, the online dimension to the offline dimension. Um, and uh, I think uh, this is what I, I, I wanted to, to answer. I don't know if I answered to all the questions, but I will come back if, if, if needed. Thank you very much, Joanna. So over to you, Solha. You had the questions of basically <laughs> how a person can get accountability and reparations, and then how we can enforce these rules at the international level. But there's also a question coming in on the possibilities of actually using international courts like the the Hague International Court of Justice or the ICC. Please. Yeah. Um, so you you gave a very specific example um, and talked about um, somebody in Mali. Um, the, the the working group on the use of mercenaries. We um, one of our so the, let me just explain what the working group is. I can just take the opportunity to 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 to, to give you a, 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 an overview. So we are um, a group of five independent human rights experts appointed by the Human Rights Council um, to address issues around mercenaries, mercenary related actors, and private military security companies. And we're given various tools to do that. One of the tools that we have is, or one of the things we're required to do actually, is to produce two thematic reports every year. One goes to the Human Rights Council and one goes to the UN General Assembly. And we actually um, uh, produced a report on accountability um, of mercenaries and PMSCs in, uh, in 2022. Uh, um, and that report highlights the difficulties that victims have in accessing, accessing justice. Um, and uh, one of the things that they can do is they can uh, uh, send information or uh, NGOs can send information to us as part of the special procedures. And we can issue what are called allegation letters or communications, which are essentially letters that go to the, the relevant actors. So it can be states, it can also be non-state actors saying, we have received information about these um, allegations and um, about human rights violations or violations of international humanitarian law. What do you say to, to that? And uh, states are supposed to, to reply to us as part of their human rights obligations. If they don't, it's the sort of thing that would be highlighted in, uh, in their um, uh, uni uh, universal periodic review um, of, their, of their human rights situation. So we have um, uh, written letters to 
um, the Russian government uh, to even to the Wagner group to um, the all of the parties in Libya to the the, the government and and uh, Wagner related companies in Central African Republic to Mali saying we have received information now we are not a we are not a, um, a court we're not a tribunal um, we're different from, say, the, the, the treaty bodies of the, the United Nations. Um, one option that the victims uh, might um, uh, use is the is, uh, human rights mechanisms. I've literally just received funding from the European Research Council for a project on accountability because this is a huge gap. We simply don't know. We, we are not seeing victims using existing human rights mechanisms to try to, to get access um, to justice. So we want to, we want to know if those mechanisms are suitable. But ultimately, what we have to remember is that the primary obligation for protecting human rights rests with states. So that, that is the clear obligation under international under international law and specifically under international human rights law and international humanitarian law. So what we what we would want to see is that states have in place suitable mechanisms, appropriate court systems, appropriately uh, trained uh, independent judges, appropriately trained uh, lawyers. Having the whole, you know, a holistic approach, having a, a legal system that is able to to deal with um, these kinds of violations. Of course, that's that's you know the, the worst case scenario because actually what we want to do is prevent those human rights violations or IHL violations happening in the first instance. And uh, and this is the problem with, with, with these kinds of actors because they are not being properly regulated, because they are um, because states are using them to circumvent existing international legal obligations. We don't know what training they have. We don't know um, who they are, um, and and it's it's becoming an increasing problem, especially because we're seeing recruitment from conflict affected countries. We don't know if they've been involved already in war crimes, in crimes against humanity, other human rights violations. Um, and at the moment, we're, we're the international community is not dealing well with either preventing the use of these actors and make uh, um, uh, or, or making sure that if they're being uh, if they're being used, that they are being if you know, properly, um, properly regulated and, and governed. Um, I mean, and that's sidestepping the question of whether the use of force should even be um, outsourced to them in the in the first place. But if you're going to do it, at minimum, you need to be making sure that they are going to comply with international uh, international law. Um, and that's what's not that's what's not happening. Um, in theory, it would be possible um, to uh, to pursue individuals um, at, say, the International uh, Criminal Court. Um, it's but we're not going to see the the the, the necessarily the people at the on the on the you know on the on the ground being prosecuted in somewhere like the ICC. It's going to be the higher level um, individuals, and so far that's never happened. Um, there's never been an international uh, tribunal that has ever successfully prosecuted um, uh, mercenaries um, or 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 PMSCs for for human rights violations. There were. There were attempts to um, at the the ICTY, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. The, they they wanted to 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 bring some mercenaries before that tribunal. In particular, it, in in that context, it was Afghan um, uh, 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 mercenaries who had been deployed in the Balkans uh, war, um, but they weren't able to do so. They weren't. Most of them were dead. Um, um, after the, 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 the investigators um, tried to tried to to bring them to account, a lot of them were dead, or they were just completely un, un, untraceable. And this is one of the difficulties: is that these are actors that work in the shadows. They they deal in opacity. Um, they you know they, they don't want to be to be seen. They don't want to be um, identified. That's why they're being used, and so it presents. You know, really problematic challenges uh, when it comes to accountability. And if you want to look at the report, I'm just I've just put the the working group's uh, website in the in the chat. And if you look at um, if you look you can, uh, under thematic reports, you'll see our our recent uh, reports 
and uh, you can also look at communications. And so I would say, Joanna, actually, some of us are paying attention uh, to some of the, the other challenges. So for example, on the use of PMSCs in the migration context, um, we've done allegation letters in, uh, to uh, Serbia, to Switzerland, to the United States, um, because of, on the basis of, of violations in, the mig in migration contexts. Thank you very much. There's quite a few more questions. However, it's time for a break. So what we'll do, or well, it's uh, it was time for a break 10 minutes ago, but that always happens. So with 10 minutes delay, we may now take a break for 10 minutes and we will include some of the questions that we didn't have time to deal with now at the end of the next session. So. Thank you to both panelists and see you all in 10 minutes. Okay, welcome back everybody to the second session of this seminar where I will be the moderator and uh, during this part we have also a number of speakers who will uh, go more into detail. Uh, first, during the first seminar we had a, a broader overview of these issues and now we will look more into detail. I, before I uh, give the word to the to the speakers, I, I just have to mention something that came to my mind which is related to this issue, but it's a very special case. I don't know if you know about this, it was around 10 years ago where one of the doctoral students from Lund University was in Iraq and uh, the university had procured a security company and uh, uh, hired that company to get uh, get the doctoral student out of I Iraq and that was a very special case in, in Sweden if you haven't heard about it it's really re related to this issue uh, during this uh, session we will have three speakers and uh, the agreed order is that Wendy will start and then we have uh, Joanna and uh, at the end Sorcha and, and then we take questions at the end so I give the floor to uh, Wendy. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks so much for allowing me to be with you this morning on such an important uh, topic. My name is Wendy McClinchy. I'm the UN Director uh, for Civic Center for Civilians in Conflict based in Geneva. Um, first, I wanted to talk about some of the, the trends um, that we've been hearing about today on private military security contractors and specifically their impact on civilian and that the way that they are causing civilian harm, uh, including some uh, gaps in accountability, the different types of harm, and then closing out with something slightly more encouraging, which is some recommendations for, for action. Um, as we've heard uh, previously from, from uh, the previous two speakers, Joanna and Sorcha, uh, the expansion of, of private military security contractors across you know, it, it is not new. So it's been used across um, Africa from, it's been used in the in the Afghan and Iraq um, uh, experience where, where I also was many years ago, um, decades ago, but it's, you know, and it's not a new phenomenon. Um, that is both discouraging <laughs> because the trend is only increasing, unfortunately, but I think it's also, it should also be seen as encouraging in the sense that we know now the, the scope of the phenomena. Um, we know how, and we are learning how to prevent and mitigate some of the worst impacts. We sort of have identified where some of these accountability gaps are that Soha was, was discussing. Um, I do want to do, so, and that's what I'll end with. I do want to um, also highlight the distinction that Soha was mentioning earlier about this distinction between sort of state-backed mercenaries and private security contractors, which can be used um, as as uh, Joachim was just saying, employed by NGOs and really facilitating humanitarian access for good. So they're not all bad guys. Um, they're not all guys. Uh, this distinction is really important. 
you know, we have seen that there is excessive use of force, but it doesn't represent the whole industry. Um, and, and not, you know, we do, we're not only talking about uh, Wagner, although I will today when I speak about some of these examples of atrocities and civilian harms um, that have um, that have uh, occurred and and that those um, actors, these sort of bad actors do represent um, not just a uh, a civilian harm as an example of um, collateral damage, but actually as a as a business design model. Um, and that is one of the biggest uh, problems. So in armed conflict context where the rule of law and protection is really weak, as we were hearing earlier, and especially where there is where there is poor accountability or gaps, our research uh, has shown that and, and others that the unregulated use of some of, especially the government-backed um, PMSCs, as, as we'll call them uh, today, um, can really prolong conflict. So not only cause civilian harm, but actually prolong conflicts, uh, making them more intractable and increasing the risk of human rights violations and exacerbating the risk to civilians. Um, these groups are operating with impunity in many places amidst arising um, human rights violations. We know that they can disproportionately target civilians in both joint and independent operations with state security forces. We see this driving conflict in Libya, uh, in Syria, in Mozambique, in Nagorno-Karabakh, in Mali, in Ukraine, in Somalia. And again, they're not, it's not only um, Wagner. <clears throat> I'll bring a couple of examples of these up um, as I as I go through, but a few to start off with are in Saudi, the Saudi and UAE um, using PMSCs to fight the Houthis in Yemen. Uh, Knowledge Point, which is a U.S. contractor, <clears throat> is a UAE-backed um, PMSC as well that provides equipment and airstrikes to uh, Khalifa Haftar in Libya, as well as the Saudi coalition in Yemen and the regional government in Puntland in Somalia. Some offer extraction and evacuation uh, for a fee. Others, such as the Mozart Group, are doing training for Ukrainian military um, and, and adding that to their list of services. So I do want to just speak about some of these patterns of harm and what are some of the specific risks to civilians and then how they can impact humanitarian access. <clears throat> and as I said, close with a few recommendations. So civics research has shown that the presence course, the presence of PMSCs corresponds with attacks on higher attacks um, on humanitarian workers and interruptions to humanitarian access. I can share um, some of this research um, in the link after my after my remarks. Um, in some of that work, CSOs also so community um, um, community uh, groups, um, uh, civil society groups um, can also face threats, intimidations, and reprisals for reporting and monitoring on PMSCs, which makes accountability much more difficult. Um, and as in many conflicts, civilians are already impacted by um, you know in. In, disproportionately impacted by armed conflict, representing up to 90% of wartime casualties. So when we have this, this sort of other level of actor, this um, this other sector of actor, those risks drive up even higher, which is uh, can be quite difficult to imagine. So the types of harm to civilians include um, killing and wounding civilians, including harm uh, resulting from military operations, either uh, ground or air. So in April 2020, um, the Mozambican government recruited the Dick Advisory Group, it's a South African PMSC, um, to provide air support to national security, their national security and defense um, forces uh, to fight uh, Al-Shabaab. Um, and then in 2021, so just a year later, there were um, a series of allegations that surfaced um, that they were involved in a a very high number, I think they're still trying to get to count um, of civilian attacks by dropping hand grenades and firing machine guns from helicopters uh, at both civilians and civilian infrastructures, including uh, hospitals, schools, and homes in villages um, held by Al-Shabaab. Um, their contract, incidentally, was not renewed, um, but the, the, the series of actors which follow them, I think, are facing similar sorts of uh, trends. Um, we see an increase in sexual uh, conflict-related sexual violence. The UN has uh, reported this um, in the in the context where PMSCs are present. This includes instances of human trafficking. Uh, we saw that with the Dynacorps uh, personnel who were involved in sex trafficking of women and minors in Bosnia in the late 90s and in the early 2000s. Um, we, we've seen evidence of PMSCs involved in enforced disappearances, torture, and other forms of ill treatment, uh, arbitrary arrest and detention, uh, enforced displacement, and forced evictions. Um, an injury or death caused by improvised explosive device or, or IEDs and booby traps, 
So for example, the fact-finding mission uh, in Libya in 2020, I believe, identified um, a number of violations that were committed by the Wagner Group, including killing of civilians uh, resulting from landmines in areas, uh, in civilian areas, essentially, um, that weren't removed after, after hostilities. Uh, likewise, I think there was uh, there was other reports uh, along the front line from Tripoli to the the LNA front line, the coastal city of Sirte, uh, of the same thing. Um, we've seen other types of uh, harm um, manifesting in the interruption or damage of critical civilian infrastructure, uh, assets, systems, including water and electricity supply. Um, we see widespread threats and intimidation. Uh, these have a knock-on effect of causing fear and anxiety among individuals uh, and communities. So in the Central African Republic, for example, UN experts have raised concerns about the use of PMSCs um, uh, in, in uh, intimidation and harassment in, in IHL and, and human rights law violations, uh, including a, a pretty um, horrific list of summary executions, arbor arbitrary detentions, torture uh, during interrogations, uh, enforced disappearances, uh, displacement, indiscriminate targeting of civilian infrastructure, uh, et cetera. Um, so this link between PMSCs and specific forms of civilian harm can take a few forms. So the actual harm perpetrated by PMSC staff, uh, I've, I've listed some example. There are plenty of others in, uh, in Mali and Ukraine. Um, <clears throat> so for example, the Wagner group was in, in Mali um, where the Wagner, in instances where the Wagner Group um, was involved in political violence, this is according to ACLED data, <clears throat> it targeted civilians 52% uh, of the time. Sorry, that was in CAR. So it targeted civilians 52% of the time in CAR and 71% of the time in Mali. That's active targeting of civilians during their, their operation. So whether they're, they're joint or, or independent. Um, and then the harm perpetrated by armed groups with the support and willful blindness of PMSCs. Uh, and, and what's one of the strange things that, that we've seen in um, in both Mali and CAR is that one of the challenges is that the public narrative, for example, in Mali is that FAMA is a more is more effective with Wagner. So there's a, a proactive sort of disinformation campaign led by the government that tries to um, co-opt public opinion in support of these um, groups quite successfully uh, and, and thereby concealing the abuses that are, are perpetrated by them. Uh, so in CAR, the Wagner Group, um, as we mentioned, they work as state proxies. They lead uh, security and counterinsurgency training and training um, and support for state security forces. They also embed themselves in extractive economy. So timber, coffee, mining, um, that in turn has fueled CAR's uh, conflict and its toll on civilians. Um, they are, you know, as I said, they're disproportionately targeting um, civilians in Mali. They're also involved in counterterrorism operations. In Syria, Wagner was promised, I think it was 25% of oil and gas um, revenue in the territory that it held. And in this way, it's used as a tool for, for state capture. Um, I think one of the, 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 the these sort of interesting uh, mixed roles of PMSEs that can also be dis difficult to entangle, um, even when there are sort of virtuous activities that can have negative unintended consequences. So even when there's not this sort of proactive targeting of civilians, we see that um, in our Ukraine, in our in civics Ukraine program, we found that the effects of the effects in of the Mozart Group, uh, which is a limited liability company that was U.S. registered and comprised of Western volunteers uh, in the Ukrainian war, not only engaged in combat operations but also humanitarian activities um, like evacuation for civilians and and uh, removing them from dangerous areas and helping to facilitate humanitarian aid delivery. But when it disbanded, it didn't hand over those activities. Um, which left, unfortunately, it created this dependency for uh, the civilian population um, that left them in a more vulnerable position, despite um, what was probably their good intentions. Um, maybe just a couple words on challenges and accountability gaps, just building on some of those that, that Sorcha uh, had mentioned. Uh, we see weak oversight and accountability structures, uh, This, you know, especially these legal and regulatory regime accountability gaps. Uh, national legislative and regulatory frameworks. There's a real lack of transparency, uh, a lack of oversight around the work. It, it, it allows sort of PMSCs to have sort of plausible um, deniability when they're used by um, by states. Uh, allows states to have plausible uh, deniability when they're using PMSCs, uh, and thereby sort of um, uh, not acknowledging misconduct um, that has been documented. <clears throat> 
and thereby avoiding uh, accountability. Um, it makes it really difficult to monitor abuses when there are targeted um, reprisals and disinformation uh, against uh, journalists, human rights defenders, um, community groups, uh, NGOs who are um, who are trying to to monitor some of these violations, uh, which present a, an imminent danger to them. It's also very difficult to disaggregate uh, data that reflect harm that can be attributed to PMSCs. There are some examples in CAR where the UN tried to do some reporting on this, um, and and found it very difficult to disentangle reporting um, on harm caused by. Um, caused by FACA and different armed groups uh, there, and um, and the Wagner Group and other uh, and other um, um, mercenary and private contractors. Uh, we talked about due diligence uh, earlier, but by not having a sort of code of conduct and international regulatory standards, it makes it really difficult to hold them to account. And 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 then finally, this lack of redress and accountability and and remedy mechanisms, especially for um, for victims. Um, onto recommendations, just quickly to close us out. Um, you know, ways that governments can there are many ways that governments can support uh, frontline humanitarian and other NGOs in addressing responsibilities and risks, uh, and recommendations for inclusion of civil society, uh, as well as avenues relating to sort of the policy and accountability level. Um, I'll just mention a couple of them. There, there are lots more that are um, that are included in, especially in the open-ended uh, working group and the working group on mercenaries' um, various reports. Um, I do really strongly encourage you to look at those recommendations, but you know, as, as Soho was saying, more harmonized and strengthened regulation of PMSCs, especially at the national level. Um, the, the recommendations, especially around the recruitment of children, I think are really instructive and in how IHL and human rights uh, protection um, can be used uh, to, to help create uh, safeguards uh, and help um, contribute to better monitoring. Um, I think strengthening support to capacities within national judicial systems, especially national human rights institutions. Um, in some of that work, uh, applying diplomatic pressure at the international level, <clears throat> I think states providing development and security aid in particular have, have levers uh, of influence that can be used to require that states using PMSCs uh, that are registered there so subscribe to these codes of conduct and, and standards such as the uh, International Code of Conduct uh, the, and, and, and persuade them to, if they haven't already, <clears throat> ascribe to the Montreux um, document process or strengthen its implementation uh, and, and really encourage states to fulfill those um, conditions. And I think the final point is really to um, strengthen local CSO voices uh, and civilian voices, ensure that there's greater transparency um, and inclusion and participation um, in the in uh, the work and sort of monitoring and regulating um, this part of the industry. There's some emerging good practice happening in, um, in Yemen, for example, that's really interesting, where communities um, and state security actors are coming together to sort of design, co-design more inclusive security policy. I think that's in Constructive and the kinds of cooperation that can allow this work to continue. And then I think I think just a final thought is to encourage all of you that um, to consider these risks, these trends, these sort of pathways um, for action and, and hope that you will follow in Joachim's um, footsteps using law, using policy, uh, using practice to, you know, to really be uh, humanitarians um, in whatever role that you choose uh, and to and to ensure that 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 work can can really help to increase the protection of civilians. I'll leave it there. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Wendy, for this very fascinating, interesting presentation, where we also get to know a bit more about what happens around the world in different uh, conflicts. So, uh, but we are still a bit late here, so I will just move on and give the word to uh, Joanna. Your, the floor is yours, Joanna. Unmute and video. <laughs> so now I will not use uh, PowerPoints, I think it's um, it's an opportunity to to be much more dynamic. Uh, we, we discussed when we were preparing this uh, lecture, uh, if we would talk or not about the Wagner Group, the fact is that it, it is almost impossible not to talk and especially for for uh, um, first year uh, students. But let me uh, let me start by uh, mentioning that Wagner Group did not appear on Twitter or on media uh, one year ago or two years ago with, with the Ukraine war. It happened way before. And as Wendy and Sarha was were mentioning, uh, 
these companies have been operating for many, many, many years. Uh, and I'm only talking and not referring to uh, a post-Cold War scenario, uh, especially in Africa. Um, the questions of accountability have been there uh, since then. Um, the fact that we now have more access to information um, make them much more um, probably bigger and, and spectacular in the negative uh, sense. Uh, and this is very important also to underline what Wendy was saying about the non-demonization of these companies and not putting them all in the same bag, because not all of them are the same. And this is very important to, to, to reiterate, and I also mentioned this at the beginning. <clears throat> but I would like to start by saying that um there is there is um there is a before and an after uh, regarding wagner uh wagner was practically unknown until uh, to the wide public obviously uh, until they came out uh, of the shadows and and this is this is a very important moment in the history of wagner and 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 let's and let's go back to to the very beginning. Uh, Wagner um, as a group um, existed uh, before they were known as Wagner Group with other name, um, and they were effectively deployed to uh, the first invasion of Crimea in two thousand and fourteen. Um, and there are several reports on the media that uh, report this 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 precise event. The question will. In, in, in what Wagner uh, comes into the spotlight and, and what in fact differs it from other paramilitary organizations and private military companies is that for the first time, we have an oddity in this market system. So when the invasion of Ukraine happens and we uh, start um, listening in the news that there is another organization on the ground a called Wagner Group that is fighting on behalf of Russia. We have here an oddity that is very interesting from the point of view of analysis. We have a, a state versus state conflict between Ukraine and Russia when, you, when we have at the same time uh, a very a prohibitive uh, element um, uh, um, getting uh, not only um, visibility, but also at a certain point being recognized as a partner um, uh, in, in, in this conflict. And there is this before and this uh, after uh, Wagner. But I should tell you that Wagner, after the first invasion of Ukraine, had uh, been involved in several operations in Libya and in Syria, uh, between the period of, of the first invasion of, of Ukraine and the second invasion of Ukraine. And they have been striving and operating on another uh, very particular environment that is um, um, actually something that happened repeatedly with other private military companies operating in Africa. They tended not only to um, uh, implement their uh, their services in fragile countries, but also fragile countries that um, have, um, for example, uh, that are rich in, 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 in several resources. And Wagner uh, was very, very, very keen uh, as an organization to strive on this commercial relationship uh, between not only the provision of services, but also that involved not only military support, but in specific cases, for example, in CAR, uh, it involved, for example, the support uh, of, um, of elections, for example. It involved massive campaigns of disinformation. Um, and this was obviously in coordination uh, with uh, Russia and with the Kremlin, but these links were not uh, as obvious as they are, for example, in a typical organized crime structure. In fact, uh, let me tell you that in Africa, Wagner Group operated with a certain degree uh, of independence and also in bubbles. So the market itself had a different structure and strived because of local connections. Uh, I remember that um, Sorha and I were um, constantly uh, on the media talking about that and deconstructing this idea because at a certain point there was um, 
a wrong idea that uh, Putin himself Putin himself was coordinating Wagner through this media uh, mid uh, man that was Prigozhin, and this is not absolutely true. The links were there, the contracts were there with between Prigozhin companies and several uh, uh, governmental companies. But in Africa, the type of operations were completely different, and they were based in local connections that. Uh, had already um, mapped the, the, the terrain and also forged some important relationships. Were they being used as a, a foreign uh, tool, uh, as a foreign proxy tool? Yes, they were. And we know that the states where they were operating were, several of them were under the umbrella um, of, of Russia uh, during the Cold War. And this is the novelty uh, regarding Wagner. Wagner, to me, it's much more interesting, not from the point of view of how it was used in Ukraine, but about its adaptability, its plasticity, and um, in, in, in the way that they operated in these bubbles, as I said. So you have here a model um, of almost franchising of the word Wagner that brings with itself uh, power and prestige at a certain point uh, uh, in some of these countries, uh, because at the beginning they were uh, very uh, keen on, for example, having a very strict recruitment, not only in terms of the personnel that they recruited, in terms of their health, for example, their teeth, their capability. So they were exactly looking for, for people that were not only experts uh, in, in the market uh, for the use of force, but that could actually match the interests of the companies and the governments uh, they were uh, operating uh, for. And Wagner had a massive uh, number uh, of men, highly trained at the, at the beginning, also massive capability um, at the beginning. And when I say at the beginning is before the involvement uh, in, in the second phase um, of, 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 uh, uh, of the invasion uh, of Ukraine. And the interesting part about Wagner is this recalibration between the geopolitical ambitions of Russia, uh, but also um, how these geopolitical ambitions of Russia met at a certain point with a certain disenchantment of some of these countries towards, uh, for example, the United States, the European Union, the forces of st stabilization in the region. And this combination on the grievances of what was not done and promised after uh, Cold War, and also this still, and especially in 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 um, French ex former uh, French colonies, this was very particular and used as uh, a, a breach uh, to to get again into um, this um, proxy power uh, uh, enchantment, and this. Uh, has led uh, to a massive presence of Wagner uh, in, in several countries, but also to, um, with their growing presence, also uh, has grown uh, the number of atrocities, the number of reports regarding human rights violations. This has happened in Central African Republic. This has happened in Mali. This has been reported to Sorha's uh, working group, for example, um, regarding uh, the, the Bucha massacre. Now, and, and how Wagner is, is so interesting from not only the point of view of the market, but from the point of the view of the new questions it has raised. So first, they are neither, uh, they are not a private military uh, company. They are not a militia. They are, they are something different. And the services they have been offering were at a certain point quite hybrid. I, I underline that this part that relates to disinformation, that part that um, that uses disinformation as a foreign policy tool, has been 
absolutely pivotal, for example, to open um, the conversations between the Africa-Russia summit that happened uh, even after uh, the rebellion of Evgeny Prigozhin in, in June. So Wagner Group was very interesting and useful before it came out uh, of the shadows, but as uh, all the things that uh, you cannot control in full, because as I said, Wagner, it was not a company. Wagner couldn't be made accountable because it didn't exist. Uh, so it didn't exist. There was no, reg it was forbidden under Russian law um, to have mercenarism. So they there was basically a period where they were scot-free, not only to operate, but at the same time to gain terrain in not only the field, but also at a diplomatic level. And we have a point when, when the, the, the Russia admits that they are the financiers behind Wagner, um, that they try to control what was at that at that precise point completely uh, uh, out of control, and this in this complex dynamics between Wagner and Prigozhin and Kremlin, um, when they uh, came when they came to 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 the light, um, all the useful parts of Wagner, for example, the plausible the plausible dynability, the unknowns, the unseen, the unnamed. Uh, that died, that were lost in between, suddenly they become visible. And you have also a battle of personalities. You have a, a, a someone that comes uh, uh, forward um, as the leader of, of Wagner, who he was not at the beginning. Um, and uh, uh, he was, Brigadier was the financier, and you have a battle also of personalities, of struggle for power. So these are the novelties around Wagner that we have never seen in other uh, companies or conflicts uh, before. Um, and what, um, and many of the questions Sorha and I uh, were asked during last summer uh, related, for example, what will happen with, even before Prigozhin uh, died, what will happen with, with Wagner um, um, and, uh, and what will happen with Prigozhin and will Prigozhin take the power? The fact is that Wagner is an element of something much bigger, something that is much more dynamic and more complex um, than a normal company uh, itself. Wagner cannot be compared, for example, with an academy or with, it, with an executive outcomes where you could identify very uh, easily who was at the command, the structure of the, the company, the business model, etc. When you have this uh, almost um, uh, franchised bubbles of power that are not immediately in control uh, of the leader uh, of the company, um, this um, starts to raise uh, other questions. And my answer to the questions of the journalists, of people looking at Wagner, because let me tell you that I did my, my PhD on privatization of security on sub-Saharan Africa. My postdoc was on the use of mercenaries for migration. Um, and, uh, and, and, and the question was always the same. And my answer was always the same. They will mimic, they will morph, they will transform, and they will adapt. And what happens with Prigozhin's death? Practically, uh, nothing. We stopped listening about Wagner as we did because it was linked to a persona, but the activities of these companies continue. And the curiosity about Russian companies is that this is kind of a normality uh, in the Russian government, and it's very normal for uh, the, some generals to have their own private armies, as it is, for example, I don't know if you know, in Philippines, uh, to have these private armies associated to high-ranked officials. So this was not uh, an abnormality. This was something that was going on before, but was not 
um, uh, totally known. Now with the death uh, of, of Prigozhin, several questions uh, were asked. The truth is that some of these men have been absorbed by um, uh, existent uh, uh, military companies. Uh, before his death, um, uh, there were reports that at least 37 companies Private, secure, private military companies were up, uh, Russian companies were operating, uh, not only uh, were operating in Russia and across the world. In in Ukraine, uh, about twelve belonging to um, several uh, journals and other private entities. So this was not a new phenomena. This was a phenomena that gained another traction with the media and um, with the instant uh, information. It's also uh, worthwhile to, to, to note that um, another, another particular point uh, regarding uh, Wagner uh, had to do with his capability to adapt strategically to the shifts uh, on the policy and also uh, to, to respond to operations where clearly there was a security void and a security gap, or at least um, um, a moment where, um, where, for example, peace operations failed or where stabilization forces uh, didn't uh, fully fulfill their job. And whenever there was a breach uh, or a sign of fragility, they were already there. Um, and this is, to me, probably the most interesting part. They did not uh, involve only in conflict because of the profitability of the conflict. They were very uh, keen on diversifying their market and where they were uh, involved. Finally, I would like to mention that another game changer uh, was when um, Wagner was put on the table uh, to be named a foreign uh, terrorist uh, organization. And when there was a discussion, not only at the United States level and later at the e European Union level about sanctions and how to sanction. But it was extremely difficult to sanction the non-existence of, of something that it would be very difficult to, to materialize. So the first sanctions were towards individuals and freezing assets, uh, uh, et cetera. But this potential for, for categorization of Wagner as, as a foreign terrorist group was highly debated and highly discussed. And at that time, when we, uh, Sorge and I were asked this question, it was very easy. If you change a name, if you morph, you can easily escape, for example, uh, these sanctions. And this has been happening over uh, and over and over. As Sorge has said regarding Wagner, only one person was actually um, uh, prosecuted. Um, and this leads me, uh, I think, to, 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 to Sorha and to these uh, new strategies and triggers and how they have been striving, and also the legal ambiguities. How can the legal framework respond to this um, rapid morphing, rapid adaptation of these companies or of these paramilitary organizations? And also, if there is a, a need to uh, understand how global geopolitics can more rapidly and, and policy agendas can more rapidly adapt uh, to these challenges uh, brought by these companies. Because as I said at the beginning, we started from a certain provision of services, but as uh, war and threat has evolved uh, itself, these services have also expanded and adapted more rapidly than, than policy and, and the legal framework has. So um, this is what I, I really wanted to, to say about uh, uh, Wagner. Um, if you want to know more about Wagner, we wrote vastly about this before Prigozhin came out and after Prigozhin appeared. Um, and I would be happy to share it with the students um, in a after moment. Thank you.
Okay, thank you so much, Joanna, for, for this also very interesting presentation. And uh, as you say, I think that for people not working in this field, really, Wagner is, of course, uh, what you hear about. And, and it's also interesting, interesting to hear that the picture is not that easy, as you might get the impression sometimes uh, through the media and so on, that this is a, a very... Uh, special type of construction and so on, ma raising also many legal issues. But uh, uh, now I will leave the, the floor to Sorcha for, for the last presentation. The floor is yours, Sorcha. Thank you, Joachim. And, and thank you to, to Wendy and, and, and Joanna. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure to be on the panels with, with you both. Um, I think what I want to do is to, is, you know, <laughs> as Joanna said, we don't, we don't want to keep talking about Wagner. But uh, uh, so I want to try and drag it away <laughs> away from Wagner just a little bit. But unfortunately, we 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 can't um, uh, in, entirely. I think I want to try and locate some of the the problems in in a in a, the you know more of a, a global global context. When um, uh, when Russia invaded uh, Ukraine, the working group issued a statement. Um, a general statement about how uh, contemporary mercenaries and mercenary related actors uh, were appearing and more active than in any time in, in, in recent recent history. And as, as Wendy has, has, has pointed out, they have been involved in the most egregious um, and serious violations of human rights, and of international humanitarian uh, humanitarian law, everything from from uh, mass from massacres, torture, sexual and gender based violence, um, uh, disappearances, arbitrary detention, looting, um, indiscriminate targeting of uh, civilians. You know, it's the it's a, a spectrum of um, of of atrocities that has been committed by these actors. But as you've been hearing from, from Joanna, what we've seen is that um, they are different today. They're different from how we, um, we understood them uh, to be, you know, even 10 years ago, 15, 15 years ago. So uh, one of the things that we've talked about is this, this, this proxy relationship with states which is is something that's 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 different. It's been as we've we've heard the phrase plausible deniability. They've been used as a way uh, for states to insert themselves into what look like um, civil wars. They look like non-international armed conflicts, but it's a way for states to insert themselves into these non-international armed conflicts without being formal parties to the uh, to the the conflict so we've seen that happening in uh in libya for example so we've seen turkey and russia both inserting themselves into that conflict um and destabilizing the 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 destabilizing libya being involved in in human rights um atrocities um undermining the peace process undermining the democratic processes because the the um, one of the, the prerequisites for elections in Libya was that the, all of the mercenaries should leave the country. That didn't happen. Elections ended up uh, ended up being um, ended up being delayed. So there are big issues, you know. There, rather than you know, not, not just about it's not just about Wagner in one particular situation. It's about these you know, more general uh, big issues. Um, we've also uh, so we've got we've got the issue of, of of proxy actors being very problematic, and I think one of the concerns with Wagner is that other states are looking at how the international community responds to the Wagner Group and to the the to its 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 behaviors. And the reality is the international community has not really been able to deal. Uh, deal with it effectively. Joanna talked about, you know, we're, we're seeing, um, you know, the, the EU is, is putting in place sanctions on named individuals, on named companies. We're seeing the United States um, uh, categorizing um, the Wagner Group as a, um, as a transnational organized crime uh, network. Now, 
for individual states, it, it's important that they do that because it means that they can they can access funding mechanisms and ways to deal with it. It also sends out a political message. But when it comes to, so coming back to one of the questions that I was asked earlier in terms of um, prevention or in terms of accountability, that those approaches are not going to either prevent the, the, the use of these kinds of actors in armed conflicts, nor is it going to ensure accountability um, uh, and access to justice uh, for, for victims. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, there's a, I get, so it comes back to this point of there being a huge gap um, around accountability. One of the other, um, I think, um, interest, you know, one of the things that we have to understand is that when these actors are used in armed conflicts, um, as I mentioned in the case of Libya, they, they undermine peace processes, they exacerbate and prolong conflicts. They have no interest in bringing conflicts to an end. Um, and Wagner's interesting because uh, it, it's been used, as, as Joanna said, as a geopolitical tool, but it's also been used as an economic tool by, by, by Russia. Um, so when you look at where Wagner is, is, is operating, you see um, that it's, it's being paid in very often, not always, but very often in access to natural resources. Um, so we saw that we see that in in Central African uh, Republic, for example, getting mining access to to mining concessions. So um, the Wagner Group and its successors. You know, this is why when people said said, oh, when 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 Prigozhin and and, the, and some of the other leaders were killed, and people said, well, that's that's the end of Wagner, that's the end of of um, uh, of, of Russia's adventures in 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 Africa. Um, and, and saying, well, you know, there's going to be no more Wagner groups. So, well, maybe not under that name, but the the, the entity, the, the the actors are never going to disappear because it's too important geopolitically and economically for uh, for Russia. Um, and so this is, and, and and if we move beyond Wagner and you look at what you know Turkey has been doing through Sadat, for example, um, you see that um, Turkey has been inserting itself into armed conflicts. I mentioned Libya, but also to the into the conflict um, between Azerbaijan and Armenia um, by sending uh, sending uh, recruits to uh, to Nagorno Karabakh. So again, there's that pattern. We're starting to see this pattern emerging about countries inserting themselves into into armed uh, armed conflicts without being party to the to the conflict. Um, we know that in 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 Africa that there are there are multiple um, Chinese uh, private military and security companies, and they are very much tied to the protection of um, uh, mining concessions. Again, so we've got lots of countries that are inserting themselves into different countries, into different into different regions, um, either more prominently or less prominently. Um, but but all but but patterns are patterns are emerging. Another pattern that has emerged that is is hugely problematic, and and again, it really distinguishes contemporary mercenaries and private military and security companies from from um from just a few years ago is the recruitment practices so historically you know it, you know joanna talked in her first her in the in the first part of the lecture about the history of of mercenaries and historically mercenaries um even into the you know to 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 um the early part of the 21st century were predominantly ex military personnel very often ex um forces ex marines ex, sorry, ex ex special forces ex marines ex paratroopers often at the the sort of very very highly trained um uh, uh layer of ex military personnel and they were very very well paid but when you look at the numbers that were deployed um, in the 20th century, in the, the early part of the, the 21st century, the numbers weren't necessarily very large. So if you look at, um, there was a, a, a company called Kini Mini Services, a British company that was deployed in Sri Lanka in the 80s. Um, they weren't deployed in large numbers. If you look at um, the mercenaries that were deployed in Equatorial Guinea or in uh, Angola, they were, they, you know, they were handful, a handful of, 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 of these types of actors, and they were very highly trained ex-military personnel. Now, when you look at entities like the, the, the Wagner Group um, and, and others today, they started off being um, all about 
um, ex-military personnel or ex-police tending to be quite quite highly trained. And somebody asked in the last session about um, what's the connection with the with the with the far right. Well, one of the things that we've seen not just with Wagner but with other Russian um, mercenary type entities or PMSCs is that they are extremely interlinked. There's a lot of overlap in terms of the personnel and the leadership, and there are very, very clear links to uh, far right ideology um, and fascism. Um, and it's also tied up with um, with the, the, with with Russia's um, um, desire to 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 you know to create a new Russian empire. So you see things like the um, the Russian um, imperial. Uh, Army, you know, they 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 make reference to imperialism. They make reference to um uh to uh, to um a Slavic um ideology, and and there there are hierarchies within. What you see is there are hierarchies within these organizations. But one of the things that that happened, particularly with with the Wagner Group, was that the the war in Ukraine created a huge demand for more personnel. And so this is when we see a new phenomenon emerging, and that is the recruitment of, uh, well, we'd already seen recruitment of individuals from, from, as I mentioned in my presentation earlier, recruitment of individuals from, from other conflict-affected countries, particularly Syria. We see Turkey and we see Russia doing that. Um, but what happened with, with the Ukraine conflict is that Wagner also starts looking to Russian prisons, and that, that got a lot of attention in the, in, in the international media. Um, but what the, those, those, those recruitment paths are really problematic, because what we've seen happening is um, that in some circumstances, individuals are willing to be recruited, but many more are are being coerced or put under pressure or duress to become um, recruits, and so we see a layer, a new layer of human rights um, uh, violations taking place, and we're in the bizarre position of where mercenaries or mercy type actors, the individuals, can themselves be human rights uh, victims because they are being trafficked. Um, for the purposes of um, of mercenism. So there were reports, for example, out of Syria, where you've got really terrible socioeconomic circumstances, um, you've got a conflict affected country, you've got, you know, literally no, you know, no employment for for uh, large sections of the, the population. And so you see large numbers of, of, of Syrian men, all ages, including some under the age of 18, and and much into much older age categories than would normally be recruited as 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 personnel, um, being recruited because they're being promised large amounts of of money, but they're also being promised things like Turkish nationality, as I mentioned, or citizenship, as I mentioned earlier. But we also got reports that some were being uh, their families were being threatened. Their the 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 women and girls in particular in their families were being threatened, and we see the same pattern emerging. Um, in 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 the Russian prisons, we're seeing um, uh, this form of what we call what we call predatory recruitment um, uh, taking place in Russian prisons. So yes, some of the prisoners um, volunteered to to go and fight in 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 Ukraine, but others were were coerced into it. And it really, you know these kinds of practices raise all sorts of additional issues. Because it undermine again, it undermines peace processes. What happens when you know these these prisoners in in, in from Russian prisons have been you know promised release um, uh, from their from their they, they, they've been released from their their sentence. They're going back to their communities. There are already reports of of more crimes being committed uh, committed uh, by them. There are no there there are no reintegration. Um, um, processes, um, and it's not it's not a surprise that we're you know we're hearing reports that that people are being recruited from from Colombia now, for example. So another conflict affected country, another country with a lot of people with a lot of experience of 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 fighting, and so we're seeing a cycle. We're seeing a cycle of violence being uh, being 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 um, perpetrated. Other aspects of, of predatory recruitment, we're seeing um, 
uh, again, particularly in particularly in Russia, we're seeing um, again this 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 hierarchy of of um, of personnel, um, and that hierarchy is racist. Um, it's uh, it, it 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 what what we see happening is that that people were being recruited from um, peripheral uh, Russian. Uh, Russian uh, Russian states. We're seeing youth clubs um, and sports clubs uh, being uh, being being targeted, and um, and if and again, if you look at what's what's happened in Ukraine, the the people who've been recruited from prisons, who've been recruited from the the peripheral states, um, have been used as cannon fodder. Um, they have been put put forward, and the more experienced, more uh, with the, the more experienced uh, personnel who have the the the, the military backgrounds have been have been uh, kept uh, kept back. Um, and so, you know, we, we've we've got violence begetting more violence. Um, the the cycle of 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 recruitment is is it, it, from from. Um, from situations of armed conflict is 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 really alarming, um, because it's you've got people who are who who've either had fighting experience or no fighting experience. They've not been trained. There's no there's nothing in place, and it's very very different. You know, people often say, "Well, what's the difference between you know a, a, a mercenary type actor being in an armed conflict and and the military being in a conflict?" Well, in some senses, there's no difference. You know, everybody, they're all capable of violating human rights. They're all capable of violating international humanitarian law. The difference is that when it comes to accountability, there is more chance of being able to hold um, military personnel responsible for atrocities because you have um, you have chains of command in place, um, you have uh, codes of military uh, justice in place, you have court marshals, uh, courts martial processes in place, you have people wearing uniform, they're identifiable, they have um, insignia, they have numbers. It's, you know, you, you, you do stand some chance of being able to identify people. When it comes to, to entities that have been uh, recruited, and, and sent into our armed conflicts for these mercenary type actors, it's almost impossible to uh, to uh, to identify them. Um, and you know, even in even in Central African Republic, the civilian population, when when Wagner was first in in um, in Central African Republic, and involved in atrocities, the civilian population were able to say, well, it was the white guys, it was the Russians. They might even have said it was Wagner. But with the increase in recruitment, and we're seeing people being recruited from places like Chad, from Niger, who are going into, into conflicts in, in, in Libya, it becomes much, much more difficult to, um, you know, for um, local populations to identify, to identify people um, because they're not wearing uniforms, they're not wearing insignia. They, they may come from the region. Um, rather than coming from 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 the global north, it becomes more and more difficult to to actually I, I identify them. Um, and um, at the moment, the international community is not doing a good job in in terms of um, either preventing the use of these these kinds of these kinds of actors or ensuring that victims get access um, to justice and accountability. And I wish I was able to give you a slightly more positive um, um, perspective, but, but, but that's, the, that's the, the reality of the situation. And I think what's most alarming is that a lot of, there are a lot of countries that are sitting back right now watching how the international community is not able to to, to deal with this and it, um and in the meantime um it's civilian populations that are that are that are being uh, that are being harmed and I'll stop there thank you very much Sarsha for your presentation also very interesting to to hear what is going on in this field uh, we don't have that much time left of the seminar and we have rather many questions from the audience so I think we'll try to uh, to ask some of those questions to you, perhaps not all of them, but I will try to direct questions to 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 the panelists here. And I think I'll start with Wendy. We have a question here. Civic works on protection of civilians in many conflict zones. Does the presence of PMSCs affect your work? Does it change how you engage in promoting protection? Uh, 
Yeah, it's a it's a great question and actually one that I um, pose to uh, my colleagues uh, in the field in the lead up to this. And um, and I and I I got I, I didn't get a coherent answer from all of them. So I suppose the the main takeaway is that it affects them in different ways. Um, some mentioned um, sort of access to communities um, and, and this falls into the category of, I think, uh, humanitarian access um, issues that I raised earlier. Um, whereby some humanitarian actors, um, you know, are prevented from uh, accessing accessing populations, um, you know, to provide protection services, whether it's provision of of aid, et cetera, to um, to access to evacuation routes and security and and other protection services, or to sort of self organize. I mean, in some contexts. Um, so I talked about the unintended consequences in the Ukraine example, um, but there are others in Mali that I know of, uh, and I and I think also in Niger, where um, the kind of work that um, that we usually do with communities, where we where we help to support uh, community protection groups, can be inhibited by the presence, you know, even within the sort of local area um, of some of these actors um, who who um, engage in the kind of um, threatening behavior, even if there is not yet, I'll say yet. Uh, a kind of record of direct harm, simply the presence of those actors um, can cause the kind of um, fear that would prevent uh, communities from self-organizing and thereby being uh, proactive sort of agents for their own protection, which is the kind of work that we've seen very, and other humanitarian actors in this space, very good results with, and, and by far is the most sustainable. And that can relate to you know, early warning networks, right? Where you've got um, these sort of community alert networks and um, the UN supported some of these in in um, in North Kivu in the Eastern DRC, uh, where you've got community groups that um, identify a sort of potential threat um, uh, of harm, whether it's by a, a nearby armed group that they have heard is sort of coming into their area. And, and then um, sometimes a third party actor, whether it's a UN, an NGO, can help direct those requests to uh, a state security actor. So that whether it's the FARDC in, in that case, or police to help intervene, to help protect those communities. Those networks break down when you have the presence of other um, actors, other armed actors outside of that, um, you know, outside of the chain of command and, and um, creating the kind of um, threats uh, and intimidation and where there is a history of reprisal. Um, I think those are probably the most pronounced um, and maybe the most inhibiting. Um, but then I just go back to this sort of overlying point that we've been talking a lot about today, which is just undermining any effort at accountability. Um, so whether it's, you know, we do also a lot of work with state security actors where we create um, kind of dialogue, whether it's part of a formal peace process um, or, or something a bit more organic or local, create inclusive dialogues between communities or civil society represented, so, you know, representatives, so civilians themselves who are affected by conflict and state security actors, um, both on the military and on the civilian side. That kind of dialogue has had really good results but again, when you've got this sort of proxy actor that, who is not sitting at the table, who is not part of that engagement, it it it, it just makes those efforts much, much less um, potentially effective. Uh, and, and any kind of security sector reform effort whereby you're trying to strengthen um, civilian protection, you know, from the policy level all the way down to the kind of doctrine, operational and tactical level, um, other work that, we, that that my colleagues also do, um, all of that is also, it can only be, even if it's sort of in the best case scenario, if it's effective within a state security force, you know, if they're outsourcing, you know, many of their operations, and if these actors are increasingly acting independently, I mean, not even in joint operations, as we've seen, you know, for the last few years, especially in, in CAR, but now also in, in Mali and elsewhere, then what control do they and influence do they have um, at all? So yeah, incredibly uh, frustrating at at, um, at a number of different levels. Mm, thank you very much for that. Do, do I understand you correctly? But you are also in direct dialogue with the private contractors um, and state security also. So yeah, um, I think I'll move on to a uh, question here to Sorka. Uh, to what extent are states bound by an obligation of transparency in international law to disclose arrangements with PMSCs, essentially regulated by commercial contracts? 
Yeah, I saw there were there were a couple of couple of questions about that. I think that <laughs> the the um the answer is that these kinds of contracts are extremely obscure. They're 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 obscured, I should say. Um, I think the answer to that is quite quite straightforward. States tend to say um uh that they are um if it's if it's if it's a if it's a, a um if it's a Western country that has a public procurement process um, um, or the EU that has a, a procurement process, um, they will tend to, to yes, the, the process may be followed, but it will not be made public because on the grounds of national security. So national security often gets used as a sort of blanket um, way to, um, to, to, to hide um, these kinds of contracts, uh, it's it's almost impossible to see them. There is another the the, the other you know way that gets that gets used. We saw we saw Russia using this in terms of of Wagner was was under bilateral agreements, so uh, between at the government level, so between um, the the Ministry of Defence in Russia and the 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 the, the car the car government. So that you know that that's the the the, the contract. Um, uh, there, but even there, we still, we you know, we we still don't know what the content of that bilateral agreement um, actually is. Um, Russia, in its response um, to the working group's communications on this, has said has 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 acknowledged that there's a bilateral agreement. So Mali did as well, Central African Republic did, um, but but we don't know. Uh, but they, they they we don't necessarily know. What the 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 financial reward was, for example, we know that you know that Russia or CAR or Mali says, well, it's for the the, the service that's being provided is, inst is is instruction and training of um of FACA and FAMA, the 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 Malian and CAR um military, but we really don't know an awful lot um uh, beyond. This is where this is where I think what you know what um what Wendy was talking about in terms of um you know careers in 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 humanitarian the humanitarian context this is where civil society is incredibly important because so often they're on the ground and we we get sort of um we get information um uh, from them and we can we can kind of it's like a jigsaw you can sort of you get information from different different sources but in terms of actually seeing the contract i've never i've never in my career seen seen a contract in any in any in any context joanna may well have but uh i i certainly haven't i'm gonna i'm throwing you under the bus there joanna i'm sorry <laughs> yeah joanna do you ha have you seen any contracts in your career cannot say yes or no but uh well actually um these contracts um and and how the proxy link between the Russian government and the other governments, uh, for example, the African governments is made is usually through middle companies that are most of them, as Wendy said, um, uh, related to the exploitation of resources, but who have a, a big share of uh, these uh, where state has a big share on these companies. So this happens uh, this happens in, in, in several countries uh, in Africa where they operate. So the, the, the arrangement is done through the companies where state has a big presence in, in, terms, of, um, in terms of ownership. Um, and the agreements are usually made, uh, are bilateral agreements. We saw several agreements uh, at least being launched to the table. We don't know the end of these agreements after the last uh, Africa-Russia summit. But I think there is an important point to, to underline and uh, about the success of these companies, especially in Africa. And I'm not only referring to the, 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 the Russian or the Chinese or, or even the Turkish. There is something that is evident, that there is a power vacuum. There, there is something that was left behind. And basically um, the speech uh, uh, and I mean from, from Russia, and much more uh, uh, slightly shaped from China, uh, whose um, uh, private, uh, mili uh, private military and security companies usually are connected to Chinese investments in Africa. So let's that, let's put this uh, very, uh, this is very uh, interesting from the point of view of how they work and how they position themselves in the market, in the market niche. So we have 
the Turkish are very active, for example, in recruitment, in identifying uh, core uh, assets that are highly trained, that have uh, experience in combat or in even in espionage and sharing information and, and, and obtaining information, for example. Uh, the, the the Chinese ones are usually deployed to protect Chinese interests and Chinese interest of the companies of the Chinese companies is completely organic from the point of view that there is always a state share in Chinese companies. There is no um, 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 privately owned uh, Chinese company in China. The state has always a say. So in a certain way, the organic of the control is much more evident and clear and some and somehow transparent for the, the sake of the discussion. In the case uh, of, of Russia, the interesting part is that you have a whole new dimension that involves um, a political speech and a policy agenda that was clearly set up to look at African partners not as something inferior, but as part as partners at the same level. And this is has this has been, I think, the greatest um, um, a power uh, of of Russia in the negotiation of these contracts. Whenever he approaches uh, an African country, is always with the language of partnership, of developing, of partnering, not of exploiting. It's always about a confluence of interests. Obviously, this is rhetorical, but this is the official message. And the official message has also uh, provided structure and substance to the operation of, of these, of these uh, companies in Africa. Probably he will. Putin will never say that there is a power vacuum in Africa, but he has detected the fragilities uh, amongst uh, uh, the power relationship between governments and civilians, and also how these governments, um, which he selects according to their resource richness, and it's not only about oil or about gold or about diamonds, it's also about rare metals, for example, that are crucial for uh, technological development, but also, and very importantly, let's 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 bring this to a macro sphere and to understand the impact, for example, of the Ukraine uh, conflict. There was a massive impact on food security. There is, there are several Russian investments, for example, in Africa, to support, for example, um, uh, the production uh, 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 of food, the cereals, etc. So they, for they had the, cap the capacity to foresee what the war with Ukraine would bring if it. Uh, it was prolonged um, for um, in time. I think this was the, the 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 point that Russia didn't really calculate it well. But he, Russia was capable of, um, in a kind of horizon scanning, trying to cover up with African countries and their uh, resources how it could uh, eventually. Um, support the war effort uh, uh, in the case of the conflict be uh, between them and, and Ukraine. And I think this was a major, major shift and a major difference between, that is why Wagner is so uh, interesting from the point of view of oddity in this environment, because it's not only about the commercial dimension, it's not about the market only, it's about how the market serves the purpose of uh, the policy agenda, how the policy agenda is shaped. And I think that's the interesting part about Wagner and how, to me, this um, brings us to other discussions that go beyond the, the question of, of accountability and 
And I saw one of the questions of the students uh, relates uh, to NATO and how, for example, uh, um, power uh, power uh, organizations, international organizations, and 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 countries like uh, United States, China, Russia, Turkey, uh, big play, and then European Union and NATO are the big players, and how this has completely shaken the what was what we took as a given. Um, what we knew as 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 a market dimension only, we jumped to another thing with Wagner that we are still trying to uh, label, and uh, that we will try to find answers to because what we do not label, what we do not categorize, um, in time it will be in time it will be much more difficult to 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 tackle. Thank you, Joanna. Uh, I think I'll allow myself also to ask a, a related question. It's probably primarily to Sorcha uh, from from a legal perspective. I, I I haven't worked myself in this particular area, but I'm uh, generally interested in the relationship between public international law and and uh, domestic law, and also the relationship between public and private law. And even though you describe this as it's not only about commercial interests, uh, etc., so, so we can see that these actors are of, of very different types and have different interests and different types of relationships with, with states and so on. Uh, we talk about contracts, and uh, which type of private law uh, construct. So I, I was just curious when you work uh, discussing different types of regulations that can, can come can be applied in this field and so on. Do you run into this uh, issue of, of the relationship between public and private law? Uh, also the relationship between, because what comes to my mind is also private privatization in domestic settings and so on that it raises a lot of new questions when public uh, services are handled by private companies and so on. So I, uh, if you could just say something short about that. Uh, I can say something. Uh, I can say something short. Whether it will be very meaningful is another, is another, another matter. I think. Yeah. I mean, this is this is this is always always a, a big question. That and this is this is exactly what happened after uh, after the Balkans, after Iraq and Afghanistan, was that we were seeing increasing um, privatization, increasing outsourcing, but it was not being accompanied by um, adequate regulation. Um, and what's alarming is that we're now heading into a situation where we see particularly Western states um, talking about, well, we have the, you know, a new business and human rights treaty, for example, where um, we, we, you know, that will be sufficient to regulate private military and security companies and uh, that are providing all of these, you know, new security services and all of these new spaces um, and for me, that's very dangerous because there are specificities around these types of actors that um, are, are, you know, they're very different from any other kind of business actor. They are authorized to use force. They, in certain circumstances, can detain people. They can, um, uh, you know, invade. You know, they can be in, 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 uh, in impact somebody's bodily autonomy with their if they're doing searches. Um, they have access to private um, information, um, whether it's medical information or or other other private information. They are very very different. And the, the, the reality is that even states that do regulate these kinds of actors, it comes back to my point, they are under-regulated um, and, 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 and specifically from the, 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 the human rights perspective. I'm definitely, I'm not a contract lawyer, um, but I, you know, and I, but I, you know, I do know that in the, in, I come from the UK originally and, and in the UK, you know, there, there have historically been, been problems with um, uh, private actors providing public services and not being adequately regulated from a, uh, from a human rights perspective. And 
you know, there were situations where, you know, you could literally be in one geographical area and have and, and your rights would be protected, dependent on the, the actor that was providing the services and be right in a, a geographical area next right next door and not be protect your human rights would not be protected, depending on the nature of the the entity that was providing uh, that was providing uh, the, the service. So um, we're seeing an in, you know in, an increase in the retreat of the state. We're seeing an increase in um, uh, in privatization, in outsourcing, but we're not seeing at the same you know at the same time we're not seeing um, a, a better better regulation. And I think you know COVID nineteen really brought this home. You know if you look at what the 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 European Union did in relation to security during um, uh, private security during COVID. Um, private security was was uh, designated as an essential service um and but all of the procurement rules um around it were 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 just um suspended and um so states were able to 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 just go ahead and uh recruit uh, to out sorry to outsource um security but without having any kind of even even the you know, basic recruitment um rules in 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 place um i would definitely be interested in having a conversation about the contractual side but i mean that's that's what i can 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 say is that that you know, even when there are public even when there are public rules in place they are very very fragile and very susceptible to being removed in you know in, in that it well, and we see in that situation of crisis and we see you know we see the same thing happening with you know with um with um uh with migration we did a we did a very briefly we did a we did a country visit to to greece um a year ago just over a year ago and um i looked at the i looked at the 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 the, the procurement um documents that were issued by the 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 for the eu tendering process for um security providers for the controlled closed access uh, camps uh, centers in 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 greece and the 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 the, the, were, the the human rights elements were non-existent, basic non-existent. Basically, the, the the provision was that the security guards had to be polite, and uh, that was you know keep their uniforms clean, and that was that was literally the the only element that was that was to be included in this in this contract. Um, and we found that they, you know, they didn't speak English. They, you know, there were, there were, they, to be fair, you know, there were more complaints about the police who were who were operating in the camps and and the than the than the security guards. But it, from a contractual perspective, it was it was it was it was it was a, it was a shocking actually. It was shocking how poor the 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 um, the, the contractual requirements were. Very interesting to hear, and uh, I thank you for those words. We, and I think those words were the last words in this session because now uh, the clock is 12 o'clock. And uh, I want to thank all three of you for very interesting presentations and discussions. And we could have answered and discussed questions for a much longer time now, but we'll try to keep the time uh, schedule here. So I, I will leave the word to Sari and Emilia for, for the concluding words in the seminar. Thank you so much. Well, thank you from me as well. Thank you both to the panelists and to everybody who's uh, participated to make this lecture happen. And obviously to all the, to, to the public who's been part, who's been, to all of those who've been listening to this, this lecture. And when I did my opening, statement for the first session I sort of asked to be updated updated on development since my early experiences with the sort of the presence of private military and security companies in conflict zones back in Afghanistan around 2005 and um, I've certainly been updated and it's definitely clear that uh, this is an area that we will need to continue focusing on. And that particularly both those of us here who are interested in what happens in conflict zones, 
but also and maybe especially those of us who are interested in ins international institutions and in international law. So continue focusing on and think innovatively about how can we get more rules into situations that tend to evade all rules. So thank you and uh, over to you, Emilia. Thank you, Sari. So that's a wrap. I, I learned so much today. I, I hope you did too. And I think we can uh, we can all consider Sari's question on bringing rules to areas where they're evaded. So at some point, there were over 320 people listening in. Um, we're so incredibly glad that you could make it and we're touched and we're very just uh, super grateful. If you want others to partake in this knowledge, do keep an eye out for the recording. It'll be sent out and please share it with, the, with those who may want it. Just a final thank you to our speakers. Uh, Dr. Joanna De Deus Pereira, Dr. Saul McLeod, and Wendy McClinchy. We're, we're so incredibly grateful. And a big thanks to Joachim Oman, Maria Oning, and Christian Ragnarsson, Christian Ragnarsson, uh, the Seminar Advisory Committee, the Association Board, and of course, Sari Kovo. Thank you all so much for learning with us. Whether you watch this in real time or later, we're so glad you stopped by. Take care. <laughs>